Welcome to the podcast dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee. We have our head coach, Chad Timmerman, with us. Hi, everybody. And we have Orange Seal Off Roads and Specialize and Ice Frictions, Alex Wild. <laughs> hey, Good to have you back, Alex. It's been a while. I'm trying to make it like NASCAR, Chad. I'm just trying to get John a little faster at it next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time since we've had Alex on. Um, Alex, you've been busy with many things. Uh, and we're going to get into that in just a second. Really quick. I wanted to read a question that we got from Ryan. Uh, he says, for, and he, it's about adaptive training, which by the way, if you haven't checked it out yet, go to trainerroad.com and sign up. It's so cool to see how many people it's just completely revolutionizing training for, for all the, for so many people. It's just fantastic. So he says for adaptive training, when I'm following a plan and I have more time on a particular day, I go into alternates to find a longer workout. So this is really cool. So if you have like a scheduled workout, but then uh, you have more time or less time, or you want to do something that's slightly different. There's an alternates uh, feature in the app right there where you can just select ones that are alternates. He says, when doing so, I've been selecting a workout with the same progression level as what is currently prescribed. Is this the best way to go about it? And as a refresher, all every single workout in our, in our catalog has a progression level or it has a workout level attached to it. So that means that uh, it might be a VO2 max four or a VO2 max six or a 7.2 or anything in between 10 and one, or even over 10 in some cases. And in that case, what you do is you, when you get alternates, you just select a workout and it already is going to suggest workouts that are close to the same level, if not the same level for you. So yes, that is the right way to do it. Ryan pick one. That's that way, that way. So let's say you have 60 minutes and you do 90 minutes. If you do the same workout that you did, would, or would otherwise do for 16 minutes. Let's say it's like a five by, uh, I don't know, or five by five VO two. That's an easy one to think of. If you have five by five VO two, and that's going to be fit into an hour somehow, but then you have nine or 90 minutes to do a workout instead. If you were to up that to seven by two, that would be a very different workout level. That would be a whole lot harder to do two more. So instead it will have everything adjusted so that you still, and once again, this is using ML to analyze all of these workouts to get a really good calibration of how difficult something is. Uh, it's going to give you the, the right workout for 90 minutes uh, that you need. So it's super cool. Workout alternates are amazing. It allows you to have flexibility and adjust. He also says, side note, with adaptive training and progression levels, I'm actually getting faster. He says, I can see and feel the progress. Before I would get into the third or fourth week of a training block and I would start to fall apart and he says, he says, due to the ramp rates, now I'm completely block or completing blocks and seeing huge gains. He says, maybe someday I'll successfully be able to complete Carpathian peak three. That's one of our workouts there. And yeah, absolutely. You will. If you work toward it, adaptive training keeps you on track. So super cool. Uh, it allows you to progress at your own rate. Like in this case, Ryan is getting super exciting. Uh, another athlete that is super excited about using adaptive training is the one we just had on our successful athletes podcast, Matt Nussbaum. Uh, Chad, he was like not an athlete growing up. Uh, that was not his deal. And then he decided to try triathlon and he tried or started running in college just like for fun, uh, to kind of mix things up and be active and try to triathlon, loved it. Uh, yeah, he qualified for Kona and I think that it was his first or second full distance on oh, having a That's problem crazy. remembering Matt, but yeah, he did fantastic. So, and he was actually, it was a non pro race. So it was just age groupers. And for a while he was leading the race and he was just like completely like confused why there was a moto by him. And he was like, <laughs> I'm leading, <laughs> like, this is crazy. So he crushed the swim, had an incredible bike and managed on the run to, to come in. So he followed trainer roads plans to the T, uh, and just a fantastic uh, episode. So that's episode 67 successful athletes podcast link to that is down in the description for YouTube and on the podcast below, uh, Alex, let's get into you a little bit. So you had a really busy mid mid summer through the end of summer for your race season. You had nationals, then you and did Leadville and you did marathon worlds. You did tons of stuff and you got married uh, and you've been doing crazy house projects and you've had your off season. So I want to talk about the, uh, first of all, congratulations on getting married, but Thank yeah. You. yeah, yeah. Exciting. Uh, I want to talk about your off season a little bit. Cause this is the time of year where a lot, some athletes are going into or coming out of the off season. However, it's very much a topic. So what do you look for in an off on an off season? What are your goals? What are you trying to achieve with it? What are you trying to not achieve? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I try to keep it, I guess, no, no goals or minimal goals. I don't really have much or, or anything I have to do, I guess is, is 
is the way I put it. It's, it's more stuff I want to do. I take two weeks completely off the bike. So that's kind of, I guess the only rule. Um, I did break that once because as I probably mentioned before, my wife is a little more nuts than I am and had a hundred K run and one of her feed zones required riding too. So I rode my bike to, to make sure she had what she needed for her 14 and a half hour run. But Jeez. beyond that, it was just kind of whatever I felt like doing. I, I jokingly call it hiking season because Jen takes advantage of the fact that I'm off the bike and it's like, oh, let's hike the dogs over here. Let's hike them over there. And normally talks me into a 5k or so run just because by the time the second week rolls around, I want to do something. But for me, it's, it's a physical reset. It's a mental reset. It's, it's kind of just whatever I feel like doing, whatever I feel like eating. Um, I think it was Gwen Jorgensen posted about this a while ago, but, um, sorry, if you can hear the dogs in the background, <laughs> the mailman's probably here, but, uh, she's, she mentioned that she like rebels against the rules when she has this off season. I find myself doing that as well. Like I'll want to stay up late or I'll want to like eat junk food or this or that. So it's like just kind of whatever feels right. And for me, it's nice. Cause it's like, I'll just do my, my job and stuff around the house and kind of whatever, whatever feels good at that, that point. But the, Alex, the minimum is basically epitomizes my entire year. So <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you, <laughs> I like that chat. It's good living. That's what it is. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I enjoy so those Ale two weeks. <laughs> Alex, how do you get over, um, the, the crippling anxiety that you are going to get slower because uh, this is a big like thing that exists. And, and I say that a bit tongue in cheek here, but yeah, yeah. No, it, okay. it's, it's real for some people, right? So oh, absolutely. They, they look at the off season and they're like, this is time lost. Why don't I just keep training? Yeah. I think it's short-term versus long-term thinking. Um, short-term. Yeah. I may get slower, but long-term, if I continue year over year without any break, without any, without addressing those that long-term fatigue, that mental fatigue, then I'm ultimately going to get slower and not realize my potential. Um, it's actually part of the reason I, I tried cross in 2017 and I enjoyed it, but what I didn't enjoy was being full gas year round. Um, I, I blamed it on having a, like a job and a family and stuff, but it was just, it was nice to have some time to just be at home, just hit the training numbers, go to work, be at home with the family without travel. And so in a way I look forward to it in a, in a different lens. I, I like the chase. I like the grind. I really love hitting numbers. Like, don't get me wrong. I love racing and competing, but there's a different part of me. That's really enjoys like getting back there and hitting those numbers and getting faster, like experiencing that process over again and kind of seeing what we can tweak to make me better and, and kind of establish a new ceiling. And I don't think you can do that without the two weeks off, or at least, you know, some sort of rest, like you can't just keep building up, up, up. You have to go up and then come down and then go back. So that's for me, it's just a matter of long-term thinking versus short-term is, uh, and I saw that you also, you proactively are dropping your FTP because you know, uh, that it will have gone down once again. How do you manage the crippling anxiety that goes with that? Because there are a lot of athletes that come out of the off season too, and maybe you just achieved a PR for your FTP and you're really excited about it. And then to think that, oh, well, now that the season's over, I'm going to restart and it'll be lower. No way. I'm just going to keep it where it was at my all time peak. And then I'll just train into that. So why do you drop it? <clears throat> um, for me, it'd be mentally more difficult to try to train at that FTP because I, there's no way I'm hitting the, like the percentages of that FTP that I am of the new one. And again, I think that FTP means something because you earn it, you know, mm -hmm. because you can ride at that FTP. So if, if it's always there year round, then it's like, I don't know, for me, it's not as meaningful. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm also not racing until maybe end of January and it'd be like a, we have a grasshopper series around us that I really enjoy. And it'll be, you know, like a more grassroots level event. So I have two months from now. So probably three months from when I got back on the bike to get fit again. And that's on purpose. And it's like, I love that time. That's here. It's fall riding and sorry. Cause I know people are listening all over, but fall riding in California is like 65 seventies and maybe we're wearing arm warmers. So it's like, it's my favorite time to ride. And 
I think there's more to it than just the FTP. So it's like doing those workouts at the correct levels is going to set me up for success later. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, another question I want to ask you, and this is also for you too, Chad, and I'll, I'll talk about my own, but 2022 goals on the bike. Uh, what are they, Alex? What are your main things? They, they just announced, uh, Epic rides is having to scale back and they're just going to be having their Arizona events next year, which is, uh, super sad. We love that series. Todd has like really done so much to help mountain biking and, and the sport in general, uh, talking to Todd about it. Like one of his main concerns is the fact that now he's giving pro riders less opportunity to make more money. And he was really sad about that. That just shows yeah. the quality of guy he is. He's not like I'm shrinking this and thusly it's going to affect my bottom line. And every, I'm sure he's concerned about that too, but he's concerned about giving pro athletes, you know, uh, less chances to, to earn money, which thank you, Todd and everybody at Epic rides for everything you've done. And you'll be back, uh, up to whatever you end up wanting to be, whether it is a national series or not at no time Absolutely. flat. Um, but anyways, there's that series is not a national series anymore, but we have that lifetime, uh, grand prix series. Yep. <laughs> That's a big focus. Then there's also cross country racing and everything else. So what, what's your goal, uh, main goal for the season? Yeah. Um, I guess before we get into that, it's definitely worth noting that I think the lifetime grand prix is here because of Epic rides. So they paved the way and showed the success of those style of events. Um, it's a really cool vibe. Like Leadville is probably my favorite, but like we compete for the win. We're at the front of the race. Like it's a great race and it's fun, but going back to the line at the nine hour cutoff and the 12 hour cutoff to see people like completing this event and the excitement, like when you get that buckle and everything, like, you know, you've trained all year just for this is so rad. And I think it, it's rare in the XC world. I always joke, nobody shows up to an XC race wondering if they're going to finish. So it's like that uncertainty at Leadville and that like, like meeting of the world is always super exciting in, in terms of that. So, mm. uh, definitely thank you to Todd and, and Epic rides and definitely will support them. I was planning on doing before I haven't read the press release, but if Arizona and Bentonville are still a thing, then I'll definitely go to those two just from a sea level point of view. I have to be selective with how many elevation mm. races I do. And I have put my name in for the lifetime grand prix and a lot of those races suit me super well. Um, I should probably back up a couple steps and say that I'm probably not doing as much XC as I have in the past and more focusing towards marathon and gravel and fun. Um, not saying that chasing UCI points and world cups isn't fun. It's, it's something that I think if you want to do chase it, but for me at this point, I'm really excited to be able to be a successful athlete, mostly domestically and not have to travel to Europe. Like this lifetime grand prix is, is giving us an opportunity to race some of the best races and have a good payout for it. So I think it's definitely something I want to support. And, and again, all those events are much like Leadville where it's that mix of amateur and pro where the amateurs are there just to finish and beat a time. And I think that's a super good vibe. Whereas the UCI events are like, mm -hmm. it's all of the same people racing in a, an abandoned, you know, place, not abandoned, but there's just, there's not that atmosphere. Sure. Yeah. So I think for me, it's, it's about chasing fun this year and, and doing those events that maybe I had on the bucket list and was like, I'll do those later kind of thing. So have a, have a few that I want to do the, the grand prix encompassed a lot of them. Um, <laughs> I will say it now. I am definitely dropping the unbound 200 as my five out of six. I, I won't even <laughs> be at the start line. 200 miles is a little too far. <laughs> so, so if I'm selected, that's the one that I won't be at, but Chad and I yeah. feel the same. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With yeah. that will come an increase. Yeah. Well, we tried this last year and we chatted about it last time I was on, but I'll continue the increased volume and, and that has done me well. And I'm actually super excited because I think as an athlete, I'm much more aerobically genetically inclined than I am anaerobic. Mm -hmm. So I always tell people that I've kind of tried to fake it as an XC racer because that's just not like, I'm I'm definitely gifted, but to the tune of like a Chris Blevins or a Keegan who can just nail those minute, two minute efforts over and over again. That's just not the genetic talent I have, but mm -hmm. I have the ability to just run diesel all day. So I'm excited to kind of play into those because in the past we've just been like, well, the aerobic oops, apologies, the aerobic <laughs> engine is already there. 
And so we'll tune up the anaerobic engine. So I'm, I'm curious to see if we put in the volume and the work on the aerobic engine to make it even better, what we can do at events like that. Yeah. That'll be cool to see, uh, kind of stepping into the arena you're, you're built for. So yeah, absolutely. Chad. And, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just on the, on the last bit. I'm just me and my buddy, Will Foley are, are starting a privateer team. So it'll be the whole season's just based around fun. So sweet. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Uh, more details to come on that on the next time you're on, I hope. Um, Absolutely. Cool. Chad, how about you? What are your 2022 <laughs> goals? Uh, you, you're not, you're not the, the crit racer, uh, traveling around doing races all around the West coast and stuff that you once were. Uh, but these days the bike means something different, I reckon. Yeah. And on top of that, I mean, we're not even out of November yet. So I still need another five weeks to <laughs> loftily design my <laughs> 2022 goals that which I probably won't accomplish anyway, but I, I, I need to give some more thought to them. Uh, but off the top of my head, and since you're going to put me on the spot, I'm going to put Alex mm -hmm. on the spot and Ooh. tell him that I need a, uh, shiv <laughs> because I, I need a new TT bike. I, I, my, my old TT a bike, shiv went TT to... or a shiv? Shiv, uh, the, the, whatever the, whatever the new shiv is, not, not the tri version, but okay. the one, yeah, yeah. the UCI legal one, <clears throat> because I would like to take another crack at nationals, nationals TT mind you. And then as ever might carry that fitness into the crit and road race, but all these things have to, certain things have to gel before this is even on my, on my path for sure. And you a bike a would be the first disaster workout and you can have a shift. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure, sure. <laughs> but anyway, it, 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 I would like to take another crack at that. And now I'm advancing into the 50, 54 age group, which means it really means one thing to me. It means I have a, basically a two, I think maybe a three year span of time where I don't have to compete against Mo Mike Olheiser, who who's effectively <laughs> unbeatable. I mean, like, it, it's just, I, I can't, I can't. Uh, put in the amount of time to to, sure. to match somebody like that. So it is actually big motivation early in that five year age gap to to pursue things with not I won't say diminished competition. There's just really one competitor who honestly, if you look at his splits in the past, I mean he's like minutes faster. Everyone else is separated by seconds, and he's got a couple minutes on on the rest of us, sort of thing. Mm. So Do you know where this would be for twenty? Yeah, it's in uh, I think Flagstaff. Arizona. Oh, cool. Oh, I believe so. That and I do be... think it's an entire 40 K, which, which works well too. Cause I really don't like when it's 25, 32 K, the shorter so it'd ones. be a hot one. Probably. Uh, and it's in, do... I'm trying to think of what time of year, I think it's September. Yeah. So it probably oh, be very hot. So you'll be cold in the morning and then it'll be hot because it's higher elevation too at Flagstaff. I think you're around 5,000 mm -hmm. feet. Yeah. Um, correct me, uh, Arizonis here, uh, for how far I'm off there, but I believe it's that. So that's a good spot to put a fast time in too. And these days you don't live at 5,000 feet, but you've spent so much of your life, almost all of yeah. your life at, at that and elevation. I'm still, I'm still a couple thousand feet up and that's not some big jump. I don't even think that qualifies as altitude really. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not all sure right, that kidding. would be a huge concern <laughs> yeah but coming from yeah. sea level it does but i'm already starting yeah. i think we're, i'm about 2200 feet here in spokane yeah yeah you're a lowlander now chad look at you it's crazy yeah somewhat yeah <clears throat> yeah um <clears throat> that'll be cool yeah and that's only yeah. though if it really strikes your fancy and that's something that you really want to take on right it does strike my fancy and i like a, a lot about where it is with whom i'll be competing um if i can have a new bike that always you know kind of lights the fire sure and so yeah, I, I, I'm into it, but I won't officially say that's a goal for 2022. Have to have the bike. Once I have the bike, then I can figure out excuses not to do it. But uh, I will. <laughs> I, I'll try. I, yeah. I don't know what my so the event I'm most excited for. Zero question. Single track six next year. Mm -hmm. uh, I cannot wait for that. I have to wait all the way until September for it though, because it's not in its normal July time slot or June time slot. So waiting all the way to September, is pretty tough. Also who knows with the COVID situation in Canada in particular, uh, they just canceled, uh, cyclocross national championships. So, um, yeah, so they're still going through a whole lot of issues with that. And I hope that by we, the time we get around to September, it's okay, but who knows? We'll see. So by the time we get around to January, it's still okay. We got to get a ski trip. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so anyways, I'm really excited about single track six. I know 
mountain bike national championships as of now is happening at winter park, Colorado again. <laughs> so I don't know if that whole online is real, but have you seen that? That's like uh, yeah, I have, nationals yeah. under like 6,000 feet or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And we've spoken about that request. before. Yeah. Oh, I no. believe I agree. Is. Yeah. We're talking about sea level. I'm, I'm about four above. And then when I stand up, I'm about six feet above sea level. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a yeah. massive handicap. That's, that's oh, for sure. advantage for, for the Highlanders. I agree. Um, when you're at and... 10,000, it's like weeks. Like these kids have to, especially the juniors, right? They have to find out sure. a way to stay in Colorado for almost a month. Yeah. So families have to shell out thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars just to on, be able to. On top to... of the bikes. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. It's rough. So, but that's happening there. And uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm uh, as of now, that's going to be a target of mine. I have no clue what the dates will be. Uh, so we'll have to figure all that out. But uh, yeah, also plans are shifting because I was planning on doing some of the epic rides this year. Uh, but instead of thinking I'm going to do whiskey off road because that one's still happening and I heard it's going to be awesome, like really, really good this year. Uh, they're, they got some new opportunities with it and some exciting stuff. So I'm planning on doing that, but that's in the spring. So I don't know yet, but single track six makes me super excited. Triathlon. I know everybody that's been following me on Instagram. Uh, you can follow all of us on Instagram, by the way, our handles are here down in the description, but, uh, everyone that's been following me on Instagram has been seeing me run and, uh, some swimming as well, uh, this year. And after single track six, I think my plan is to go full try and to really oh, yeah. focus in on that with, <laughs> I think Alex just groaned, um, but, uh, <laughs> Sorry, Xterra, that, that out loud. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Xterra worlds, I think would be a goal is to try maybe to be able to qualify for that. And I don't know if, uh, I ever would be able to, but that would be a really fun goal to try to take that on. I feel um, like you'd crush that. Yeah. I don't know. I, I just, that's it's always like, like a manageable distance, right? Cause it's what like miles swim. It's like an Olympic distance effectively, depending on the course. It's, it's a bit different, I think from yeah, course but on, to course, but on dirt, right? Like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. mountain bike, and then it's like a five K 10 K. Yes. It's a 10 K run trail run. Okay. Usually, okay. um, probably some variants within that. I and like the you can bike take it for six miles. Yep. Bike tends to be somewhere, I think around 40 K. Um, so, uh, yeah, maybe looking a little at the bit times in the past, it feels like it's like similar to an XC time frame for the bike, right? Mm -hmm. Like an hour and a half, two ish hours. Yep. Yeah. So I'm excited for that. That will be uh, something, but I don't think I'm going to take it on this year. The only way I wouldn't, the only way I would start doing that earlier is if they say single track six is not going to happen. And if I knew about that with advance notice, then I would just switch right over to that. So, uh, cyclists, mountain bikers, get ready to flame me for going to triathlon and going to the dark side and triathletes, uh, please welcome me with your warm embrace. Um, you're going to go sockless. I was about to say, I can't send you socks. No burning question. question. No, what do I send you? I, I will take whatever time I need in, tr in transition to make sure that I have proper length socks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever time needed. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm serious now. I've got uh, swim buoyancy, buoyancy, buoy that's a hard word to say, buoyancy shorts now. Um, I've got like the whole, I've got pole buoys, I've got paddles, I've got all this stuff to try to figure out how to swim. Uh, our pool is like blue 70 suits. I know. Right. Yeah. Those are the fast ones. Pool is like 40 degrees right now. Uh, our outdoor pool in our neighborhood. So that's not really comfortable to swim in, but yeah, and I don't know. We'll see. Nice yeah. bath and swim training all at once. <laughs> yeah. Just hop in Anyways. the sauna and then go swim and then hop in the sauna. Yeah. Uh, get ready for, uh, I guess, January timeframe. We are going to have an episode all about goal setting and we're going to talk about it. So the hosts are going to talk about their goals. Sure. But we're going to talk about the principles of good, uh, goal setting, talk about our previous year's goals and how they went and try to model a uh, proper follow-up process and how you go through and review your progress and everything else. So that, that's Chad's favorite episode every year. He can't wait to go over mm. it. So <laughs> it's it's basically define all the things I won't accomplish in 2022. Looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah. He can't wait. So, okay. Deep dive. Uh, let's get hey, into hey, Jonathan, that. Yeah, do you, do you sure. mind if I take this one start to finish? Can I read the question? Please. Cause, Cause this yeah. question more than any question I've ever decided to cover in a, in a deep dive speaks to me uh, out of 340 <laughs> podcasts of which I've been most, I've been part of most of them. This is the one that resonates most deeply with me. Nice. So, it's a long question too, but, and it and is a long away, question, Chad. but I, I left the whole thing in there because it, it really paints a vivid picture. So it encapsulates, honestly, everything I've tried to convey with, re with relation to, to cramps mm. over my, my many years as a cramp sufferer. So Wilson asks, 
asks, my question is not about cramping, but it is. What I get are inner thigh spasms. I guess technically it is a cramp. It is. However, the research I have done on this particular one is that most people who get it are sedentary people. Again, this is not a typical cramp. It is. I have had people tell me to eat more bananas and I've linked to a uh, very charming YouTube clip from Munanori Kawasaki, who's an infielder for, uh, I want to say Toronto Blue Jays. Pretty sure that's right. I know nothing about baseball. And uh, he's a man of few words, but what he says is, uh, is poignant. He, he gets it across. It does have to do with bananas and it does kind of tie into the point I hope to make today. Um, so I've had That's people funny. tell me to eat more bananas <laughs> it is where the wash. Like, yeah. drink more ele sure. electrolytes, et cetera. Mine come on after a long, hard session. And once they twinge, I either have to stop or I can sometimes limp along at about 30 to 40% if FTP. The first time I had this happen. Chad, can I stop you really quick on this? Sure. Uh, raise of hands. If you experience inner thigh cramps, when you have cramps on the bike, mm. like yeah. this is super common right? Like, yes, yes they are. like it's one of the most common spots to cramp for cyclists. Uh -huh. It's really common. And also yeah. to then experience the, once they go, then you're like terrified and you think that they're going to grab again. You just also, live in fear until, this is the, <laughs> until you're a couple this days is faster, the experience. Really. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A couple days, not just done with the ride. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah we'll talk yeah. about that. Okay. Okay. So the, the first time I had this happens was when I just started to cycle. I was about six miles from home and I felt these really weird tight twinges. So I backed off a bit and they would not stop about a mile from home, both legs seized. And I jumped off my bike, laid on my back on the side of the road, screaming in pain. I'm sorry for laughing. Speaking my language, brother. I mean, <laughs> there's just so much about that that is very vivid. Finally, after about 10 minutes, they relaxed. I had to get a bike. I had to get a ride home from a neighbor because I was too scared to get back on my bike and try to pedal. I went home, showered, made some food and sat on the floor in my living room when one leg went into spasm, <laughs> closely followed by the other. I literally would rather have died than go through this pain. I was on my back, on the floor, screaming in pain and sweating like a madman for around 10 minutes. Brother, oh. I'm, I'm, this is so relatable. <laughs> I thought I would eventually pass out from the pain. <laughs> Previously, I've been so doing brutal. sprint to full distance triathlons for several years prior to just cycling. So this was a crazy thing that was happening after all the years running, cycling, and swimming. Again, this is not your typical cramping situation, but it is. I have had <laughs> hydration cramps in all parts of my legs. We'll talk about those before. And yes, they are very uncomfortable and yes, even painful, but nothing compares to this inner thigh spasm. I only know one person, two, three, four, by, by, yeah, by my new count. Up. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're listening to this right now, as long as it's safe to do so. <laughs> it was actually had the same spasm. You know, because you can see the scared death look in their eyes when they start talking about it. <laughs> One of my snowmobiling yeah. buddies who is mostly sedentary outside of his job would get them in the evening or throughout the night after a hard day snow, snowmobiling. Again, mm -hmm. very relatable. Seven years later, I still get them. These are the only things that stop me from really pushing hard on long rides. I know when they're about to come on, so I lay on my back and straighten my leg immediately. <laughs> my four-year-old son has gotten to the point that if I move and groan, he looks at me and starts to run for the pickle juice. <laughs> yes, I do have pickle juice shots all over my house, on my nightstand, bathroom, et cetera. Oh, oh. <laughs> which brings oh, us Wilson. to the question. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was hoping that since you have such a vast audience, maybe someone else has had these and has found a way to stop them. I've listened to your podcast for years, and I know that Chad is a cramper. I've done all the suggested things you have all said and what others have said too. I do a lot of cycling, so time in the saddle is not the problem. My wife thinks I'm crazy that I want to cycle at all after the time she watches me scream in pain at least once a month. She said the answer is easy. Stop cycling. And She's not yeah, wrong. She has a point. I was going to say it. She does have a point. Oh, oh, Wilson. <clears throat> I feel bad for Wilson. Okay, and Wilson, for Wilson's so, family and everything. Again, this was, this was uh, inarguably the most inspiring question yet because there's just a lot of motivation. There's a lot of, uh, I, I can relate to this. And, and I think we're far from alone. I know you may have not interacted mm -hmm. with a lot of people who suffer from this, but I mean, there are three of us on this podcast today and three of us know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, people so, in the live chat are raising their hands, by the absolutely. way. I see little hand emojis going up right now. So <laughs> For sure. For yeah, sure. This, yeah. is, this is very common, especially mm -hmm. amongst endurance athletes. Okay. So before diving in, um, the inner thigh involvement is going to be discussed in a later deep dive because that is a thing that I do want to focus on, but today it will be the one detail that we don't really dive on. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so we will get back to that. It's probably going to tie into the strength training fund that... I'll uh, tease cool. later. 
So what follows is basically a deep dive driven by personal, mostly anecdote. And, and I say mostly mm-hmm. because the more people I talk to, the more I realize is this, this uh, phenomenon, I guess, doesn't affect, uh, or it doesn't relate to just me. So mm-hmm. Chad, from the perspective of a researcher, and I've grown fond of speaking myself in the third person, so enjoy that. <laughs> This would be my, the my, my thesis uh, or, or dissertation. So exercise, physiology, grad students, PhD candidates, my gift to you. If you ask for a <laughs> co-author credit, but it's, it's not a necessity, whatever. Okay, so the burning question, why haven't EAMCs, exercise uh, associated muscle cramps, been solved yet? And, and it's my observation after doing the research that I've done over the past, I, I'd say 10 days, but that's just the intensive research over the past couple of years. I, I think it's stalled. Uh, it, it, I keep coming back to the term multifactorial cramps are multifactorial and they can't be addressed in a single method. They're multifactorial. And I'm going to translate that euphemism for you. Researchers are saying they just don't know. And, and I'm not saying that anytime they use the term multifactorial that they don't know, because a lot of things are in fact, multifactorial cramps may be one of them. But in this case, I think they're throwing that term at it to admit they're moving on to other things that we, we've tried in a few ways to figure this one out and we can't do it. So I don't know, the research is just kind of regurgitation of the same ideas again and again. And I find it a bit frustrating if I'm honest. Mm. Okay. So let's talk about spasms <clears throat> and spasm is just kind of the umbrella term for, for everything that falls under it, cramps being included. So a cramp is a type of a spasm. You throw exercise into the mixture and an exercise uh, associated muscle cramp is what you get. And since I keep struggling with that term, we're just going to call them EAMCs from here. Um, Exercise induced muscle cramps is another term you'll often hear effectively the same thing. So first, some fun terms surrounding this uh, this phenomenon, this physiological awful phenomenon, temporary but intense, involuntary, sudden uncontrolled, unpredictable, common, forceful. And I even see use of the word titanic, which if you think in the terms of, in terms of the twitch, you know, a slow twitch, fast twitch, titanic is, is when a muscle contracts and, and the action potentials are coming so fast and furious from the brain that there's no relaxation. They just, it's just tension. And I'm sure anyone who, who has, a, has had a cramp can relate to what a titanic muscle contraction feels like. Usually painful. I, I laugh at that. They're always painful. At least where I'm concerned, muscle contraction. And these can affect small muscles all the way up to large groups of muscles. And quick disclaimer, if you you can't relate or or the word severe doesn't resonate with you, you do not have a dog in this fight. I cannot hear you talk because if you haven't been debilitated by personal, if you haven't laid on the side of the road, you're not going to understand the motivation that we who have experienced those things have when it comes to figuring out this particular puzzle. Before okay. you keep going, Chad, there are a lot of listeners that have never heard this story. Some of you have, but there are a lot of listeners that haven't. At Levi's Grand Fondo, Chad was going through a particularly crampy time at that point where he was suffering from cramps right regularly on rides. Like, And he was trying to figure it out. We'll get into more of, I'm sure he'll share what he's learned since then. But we get to the bottom of Coleman Valley Road, which is like a really steep, hard climb that you have to take. And then after that, it just, it continues to kind of batter you all the way to the finish. And we had done some really serious climbing at that point. And Chad was like starting to cramp so badly that when he got off the bike, he was experiencing cramps that just kind of locked him into an very awkward standing position. At which point we, we went over to the rest area that they had, like the, the feed zone nutrition, whatever. And it was sponsored by hot shots, that company. And, uh, Chad was, and we were like, Chad, it's incredible. It's designed for you. They knew that you were going to be cramping right here. It's perfect. So Chad took the hot shots, uh, which they, they, if anybody doesn't know, it's not exactly a tasty uh, drink to take in. (laughs) Not not delicious. No, it's not delicious. Like a spoonful of cinnamon. (laughs) Yeah. So Chad takes one in. (laughs) Looks like he's nearly going to puke. And then the cramps continue. (laughs) So he takes in more, packs his pockets full of the stuff. And then we continue oh, to ride thereafter. He's still fighting cramps. He's cramping while we're riding. And then he's also trying to not vomit from having a gut full <laughs> of this stuff that he's taking in. I'm pretty and sure Nate, you're not supposed to take five in a row. Yeah. And Hot Nate and I were- is not a thing. I was actually crying. I, I feel bad, but I don't feel bad at the same time. We made it through. I was That's crying. Now. 
<laughs> I was crying on the bike from laughing so hard at watching Chad trying to pedal, dealing with like tons of cramps while he's pedaling a very awkward pedal stroke and then almost vomiting. It was an experience to behold. Yeah. So yeah. when Chad says that this is personal, <clears throat> he means it. <laughs> That's why he, he might Deeply get emotional personal. at some point throughout yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. And I do. That is, that is one story of many. There are, there are a number of them. You've been present Remind for most of them too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ask Brandon okay. how his uh, Cape Epic experience was. If that's if that's your support mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Right <in> flats. <laughs> Just, yeah. Good luck flats. with that. <laughs> yeah. That sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Let me know when you're done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can talk about that at another time. Yeah. So, <laughs> Chad, uh, continue. Now that we know okay. that this is deeply personal for you, let's go. It is. It is. My, my motivations are clear. So, so let's talk about the theories, the going theories. And the first of which is dehydration. And this has probably been dispelled more than any other theory. Uh, chiefly, the, the argument against it comes back to the same thing. And that, that dehydration is systemic, right? It's a systemic physiological phenomenon, but exercise induced muscle cramps are localized. So you don't get a total body cramp, but you do get total body dehydration. So that's the argument against it. Not to mention that mounds of studies that keep saying there's no support for it. Uh, the electrolyte imbalance theory, this faces the same chief criticism and the electrolyte imbalances is systemic and cramps are not. Um, one study that's indicative of pretty much the consensus on this matter is from Schwellness and Oaks. And this is way back in 2004, where they looked at 72 runners doing the two oceans ultra marathon, which is 56 K. So roughly 35 miles and they took numerous pre and post measures, tons of measures, and they learned a lot of interesting things. But the one relevant to this particular discussion is that there were no clinically significant alterations in serum electrolyte concentrations. So electrolytes in the people who cramped versus electrolytes in the people who didn't cramp wasn't anything that said, oh yeah, this is absolutely tied to sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, whatever. Uh, the, the next theory is the neuromuscular theory. And this is the theory that has gained and probably retains the most traction. And if you look at a study from Schwellness in 2009, it explains to us that this is basically neurological in nature. So not peripheral, not in the muscle, but more central, central nervous system. This has to do with altered muscle control due to fatigue or really over excitation. So if you want to get specific with it, you got muscle spindles that are excitatory, the Golgi tendon organs that are inhibitory, and there's an imbalance between the signals between these two mechanisms. So put it another way, you have increased activation and either an absence or at least a decrease in inhibition, just, just an imbalance trying to shut those muscles off. And in this paper, I quote, further evidence to support the altered neuromuscular control hypothesis is required. And that's, that, that dovetails a lot of, uh, a lot, a lot of scientific research. So close with arguments like that or statements like that, because, you know, yes, everything merits further research. Um, and, and a lot of further research has happened. Remember this paper was 2009, you know, we're talking 12, 13 years ago, but none of these papers offer solutions. And this is my point of frustration. I mean, we can keep defining the mechanism. We keep telling, you know, it's, it's not peripheral, it's central, or it is peripheral, or it's, it's tied to whatever, but no one really says here are the things, or, or they do say here are the things that might affect it, but nothing, uh, we'll, we'll cover that in a minute. Nothing really works, not consistently. I'll give some honorable mentions mm -hmm. to some other theories that have, uh, you know, pre pre presented possibility, but mm, haven't really gone anywhere. One has to do with muscle damage. I linked to a paper on that, that I found especially interesting. One talks about pacing, you know, you run faster, your, your cycle harder. It's more likely you're going to face cramps. Another on exceeding current capabilities. Problem is, is all these things can happen with or without exercise associated muscle cramps. Okay. You can, we, we can get them regardless. So is there really any connection or correlation? So more theory criticisms, and, and these are kind of general to, to all of the theories offered is that you know, when they do scientific studies and they induce cramps, these are not the same thing as exercise induced cramps. So the things that happen when we're fatigued may not be the same, same things that happen when they provide, you know, or, or apply electricity to muscles and stimulate them to the point of cramping study sizes. Those are always criticized unless you have in a massive pool, they're, they're going to be criticized to similar settings. A lot of these studies, uh, especially for the hydration theory took place in an industrial settings. And we're looking at, you know, more sporting arenas inconsistent treatment effects, anecdotal evidence, case studies, clinical observations, basically all things that provide narrow evidence. And then <clears throat> recently a uh, review by Ron Mon and I think it's Susan Schriff's, if I'm not mistaken, 
kind of summed all this up and, and, and allow me to quote them. It seems likely that there are different types of cramps that are initiated by different mechanisms. If this is the case, the search for a single strategy for, for, for prevention or treatment is unlikely to succeed, which to me smacks of throwing their hands up in the air. Not, 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 we can't figure it out so much as this is the research up till now. And, you know, we're not furthering it. We don't have any other areas to explore we're, we're done with it, at least for now. Mm -hmm. Another criticism aimed at what I just mentioned, the prevention and treatment of EAMCs is that a lot of them may reduce the frequency. They may reduce the intensity, the duration, but none are consistently effective. And Jonathan mentioned the, the TRP channels. If you recall from a podcast, man, it was a long time ago. <clears throat> it probably was pretty close to Levi's Grand Fondo that we were just talking about, but it's the transient receptor potential agonist, the, the things in the mouth, you know, you basically trick your neuromuscular system into kind of, I don't know, forgetting or riding the ship, forgetting the cramp, riding the ship, whatever, pickle juice, mustard, quinine, hot shot, which honestly tastes like it's probably a combination of all those things. <laughs> Have, this, this is what With they're some about. Tabasco. <laughs> yeah, the some hot sauce mixed yes. in for good measure. Yeah, a capsaicin, <laughs> right? That was another one. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, so all these things, you know, have, have had effect kinesio taping, compression garments, massage, stretching, electrical stimulation, corrective exercises, hyperventilation strategies. It goes all over the place. And, and the point is that, that some of these work some of the time, but nothing is consistent. So EAMCs are still viewed as multifaceted, different types, different mechanisms with this, with, with all this in mind and with, with reading so much of this over and over and over again. I focus my reading on research that looks either directly or indirectly elsewhere. Any other ideas are, are up for grabs. I like, <clears throat> excuse me, at uh, pathophysiological possibilities, other dietary deficiencies, including magnesium, collagen, of all things, adaptations to endurance training. And, and while it may sound like I cast a broad net, it really wasn't my intention. Rather, I was looking for support for an idea that I had, and it led me down all these other paths and helped me refine my my, uh, or, or kind of narrow my scope to what seems to make the most sense, which is fatigue. Fatigue because the overlaps in fatigue mechanisms and cramp characteristics were just a little too hard for me to get past. And, and it got the gears turning. And this tied in very nicely to my experience over the last, and I want to say a couple of years, because I really do think it's been two years since I've had a severe bout of exercise associated muscle cramps. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Pardon me. The paper that I, uh, if you want to get super in the weeds on this topic, a paper that I lean pretty heavily on, at least trying to understand mechanism. And, and I know mechanism doesn't always tie to reality, but mechanism does help me decide, am I wasting my time? Is this something I want to believe? Is there truth to this? Uh, it was a paper by Alan and colleagues from 2008. And, and yes, we know fatigue it happens peripherally, right? It happens in the muscle case closed. We're done, but no, that's not, that's not the only place it happens. It's also central. And this is both conscious and unconscious. We can think our way through fatigue and then there are unconscious mechanisms that we can't do anything about. Right? So you ask why look at fatigue when it's the diminishment in the force of contraction. Well, contraction is just one side of a shared phenomenon, relaxation being the other side. You know, force production is meaningless if we don't have the ability to relax the muscle at the end of that contraction. And this is certainly applicable in endurance where our contractions are really on off, but it also applies to strength applications. I mean, think about if you were to do a max squat, a one RM, you're, you're coming up from that squat, you know, however low you get all the way down, butt to grass, whether you're 90 degrees, you get up to the point where you're just about to lock out and rack that bar. And there's an intense contraction across your quadriceps. Oh. What if when you rack the bar, that contraction didn't go away? I mean, this is what we're up against. This is how severe and how intense these contractions are. I don't mm -hmm. throw around the word excruciating. These are excruciating. They're very, they're, they're, they're very painful. So it's not just when I push too hard, I get cramps. Well, I'm going to not push as hard or just <laughs> suffer the cramps. No, this is awful. This has cost me some, some important uh, placings and even victory in some cases. Can I ask you some, uh, Chad, when you're talking about these, this sort of experience, just to clear the air, to make sure that it isn't understood as just my muscles are sore and they hurt when I pedal hard, but instead it's a cramp. This is the sort of thing that you have doms from thereafter for days, correct? Like, yeah, I didn't just from the cramps. I, I did want to go into that. I, I couldn't find anything readily. And there were so many other uh, facets of this topic that, that I wanted to explore, but there 
were some things that led me to believe you can actually experience muscle damage. And if experience has taught me anything, I'm legitimately sore after some of these rounds of cramping to the point where I feel like I did some, some high load, high repetition squats, you know, that, that whole did four Mm -hmm. CrossFit workouts in a row. And now I can't walk sort of affair. Yeah. Yeah. They were those, I mean, they were real sort of a touch for days afterward. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is not like a, this is the sort of thing where it's not just sore. And then once the cramp is over, you're fine. Uh, I wish it were. Muscular damage occurs that, that in some cases. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, they vary in intensity and that intensity can climb so high that I really, I got to believe there's some damage there. It's, it lasts too long for me to believe otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So cool. So, so back to fatigue, but now we know there, there, there are numerous mechanisms of fatigue. And like I said, it's on the central side and the peripheral side. So both in the brain and the central nervous system, spinal cord nerves, whatever, but we're going to focus on the peripheral side. I want to talk about what's going on in the muscle itself. And fatigue can be induced in the muscle due to a lot of things the creatine kinase, which, you know, is the enzyme that breaks down the phosphocreatine helps you regenerate ATP, blah, blah, blah. ADP accumulation, break ATP down, remove a phosphate from it, and you get ADP. Accumulation of that can influence fatigue, or there's evidence to support that it can. The phosphates themselves, once they break off, their accumulation can too. Hydrogen ions, we've talked about this a number of times, what do they do but affect acidity or affect uh, blood pH and therefore muscle pH. Potassium ions and calcium. Hmm. And I know you're on the edge of your seat. You're thinking I've come this far into this discussion new information on EAMCs, and he wants to tell me about calcium, but bear with me because I do believe there's something here. So 10,000 foot view, calcium release is responsible for muscle contraction. Calcium uptake is responsible for muscle relaxation. Okay. That's the simple of it. An action potential is delivered from the brain to the muscle via a motor neuron. It goes to the muscle cell, which is a fiber, right? That fiber is composed of fibrils, you know, smaller fibers, those fibrils are composed of filaments and there's two key filaments, myosin and actin. You've probably heard about this before. Calcium coordinates <clears throat> the activity of those myosin filaments. And I won't burden you with the whole tropomyosin, troponin, the cross bridging, all this stuff that takes place, but the calcium actually shifts shape and it allows the actin to climb the myosin. And this is the basis or the the yeah, basically the basics of muscle contraction. But the catch is that that myosin, or I'm sorry, the actin will continue climbing the myosin until the calcium is removed. And this is where a calcium pump comes into effect. So bear with me a bit more cell biology here, but if you remember the sarcoplasmic reticulum, this was an organelle that's responsible, the organelle within each of these muscle cells, and it's responsible for calcium storage and release. So it's, it's, it's the guy when it comes to everything that happened, most of the things that happen with calcium. So the action potential causes calcium release from this sarcoplasmic reticulum, the SR, and then the calcium pump is responsible for calcium uptake. And a perfect example of this, if you need to visualize it, is rigor mortis. So when you die, these little SR, sarcoplasmic reticuli, break down and the calcium is released, but there's nothing to uptake it again. So what do we get but a sustained muscle contraction, rigor, right? Okay, so now (laughs) time for the big reveal. Exercise associated muscle cramps are affected by calcium. Could this be as a result of low sugar? So, so could all these things somehow tie together? And you ask, how, how does calcium relate to glycogen, blood glucose, carbohydrate? Because, and perhaps you've heard, AP is necessary to separate the actin and myosin, but you now know that that separation is due to calcium uptake in this sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? So this uptake is fueled by ATP because the ATP binds the myosin. It gets in the way of the action. It can't continue to climb. So ATP is derived both aerobically and anaerobically, as you well know, if you've listened to any of our podcasts, anaerobic fibers are recruited as aerobic fibers become stripped of glycogen. Talk about, you know, our aerobic fibers becoming cooked. Well, that's effectively what's happening. And of course, starved of sufficient blood glucose. So whether it's in the muscle already, or we're dosing the system with it at some point, they run out. So the unintuitive takeaway here, bear with me, is that glycogen, glucose, carbohydrate is actually necessary for muscle relaxation. That, that, mm. That's real. So we actually need sugars not only to contract the muscle, but also to help it relax. So This is interesting. All, it it because, is very interesting. So, and this is very much at the mechanism level, right? Like, like you said, that was your yep. disclaimer, right? Like this is it very is. much, and there's lots of different mechanism going on. But we don't think, and like Chad's talking about, when we're talking, uh, we're talking about contraction, we think that that's where 
carbohydrate typically is going to have all of its value because that's where we're talking about the energy necessary to be able to perform that. However, ATP. we don't think about it going the other way. That's interesting. I've never thought yeah. about it on the, on the relaxation side. Yeah. Huh. So it's not just that it shuts off it's something has to be cleared and it has to be cleared actively. It requires energy to do so. Hmm. So <clears throat> you guys having listened to everything I just said, I, I have a couple of listener questions, one for Jonathan. <laughs> and then after nice. I ask you questions, I will have listened and I will qualify as a listener. So I have a listener question for me. <laughs> okay. So Jonathan, with yeah. your recent hyperdosing of carbohydrate, you've talked about using upwards of 90 grams per hour, 100, 120. I know you did a whole lot over in Cape Epic. Yeah. H has that affected your camp cramp frequency? Yeah, for sure. Yep. There's a correlation. I mean, it, it may not have, but is yeah, is there a correlation? Yes. There's a correlation in timeline of occurrence, right? Where I was taking in more carbohydrate and then seeing less instances of cramping for sure. Right. Yep. And I don't want to put you on the spot because I, I we've talked about this. So so I know the answer I'm going to get, but you've you've very diligently addressed your carbohydrate intake. Yeah. And we used to talk about cramps quite a lot, mostly oh, yeah. on my end, but also on your end. And it's just not a topic anymore. Yeah. And there's, there's one thing that's changed for both of us. So Alex, I don't know, do you have a history of cramping? You, you did talk about knowing what the inner thigh spasms felt like. And, and, <laughs> and if so, could this be attributable on the day to undernutrition? I'm scared to say I have a history of cramping. Like, like you, I don't want to be yelled at. <laughs> <But> <laughs> I, I have cramping, but definitely not like the debilitating, debilitating. days after really sore, but, um, it has also been less common since I addressed my carbohydrate intake. I think mine are very correlated to running out of fuel, but normally at the end of hard, long rides or new workouts mm -hmm. and maybe in instances where I could have fueled better. So they're, they're definitely not like terrible. I do the little, you know, get out of your saddle, do the cramp dance, but mm -hmm. that normally <laughs> tends to solve my issues. I'm not on the side of the road or needing to call a ride home. So I don't know yeah, if I can and, throw my hat in the EAMC ring. Well, yeah, but see, I hypothesize that's because you haven't got your feeling quite as wrong as I do when I go into, you know, fully prone writhings and, and, and just, just have to ride it out in hopes that I can get back on my feet. Chad, I want to bring something up here because somebody's listening to this that experiences cramps, that's feeling very identified with you. And at the same time, they may during their key training sessions or key races intentionally fuel at a high carbohydrate amount above 90 grams an hour. Mm -hmm. And they may think, well, because I do that, this theory is bunk because I still experience cramps at times, but I want to bring into focus your diligence to your plan. There's one thing that you do, but how diligent mm -hmm. are you to that plan? Like Alex said, it's toward the end of races when you haven't nailed it perfectly and you're driving yourself into un uncharted territory in terms of how hard you're pushing yourself for how long. And then, but your nutrition isn't also increasing at that same pace, right? And if your nutrition is not keeping pace with your effort, you are going to be in a spot of undernutrition. That's what happens. Like that, that's, that's the case. And if you have a really high FTP, it's really easy to get into that position because your work rate is so great. You have a really high energy demand. So think about when cramps are commonly reported on the biggest day of the year, that big, long, hard ride, or that big event that you do. It's reported very frequently in the beginning of the season when you're getting back into fitness and you're doing things that your body is not ready to do. Yes, but think about it. You also usually don't feel that well for those early season rides because we have broken psychiatry here. And we think that, oh, I don't deserve to eat a lot of food right now because this is just easy work. And that's a bad way that we think, but I just, I'm trying to be real. That's what most people, sure. most cyclists tend to think of. <clears throat> and you're right? probably carrying some excess weight coming off of an off season. So you're even so you're like cognizant uh -huh. of the fact that I need to undernourish a bit and create that deficit so that I can gradually lose this weight in time for whatever. And it's all a recipe for putting yourself into a position of undernutrition. So when you think about the cramps, think about when they happened and ask yourself, could I have ended up in a position of undernutrition? And sometimes this is just all the time for people because they don't feel uh, adequate amounts on the bike and they don't provide themselves adequate nutrition off the bike. It's well, not, super common. Very, and, very, and that's very common. Perfect segue into my question for me is, is when's the last time I cramped? And I said, it's, it's literally been years. I think it's been two years now, give or take. What, what has changed? 
And what has changed is hyper specific. I, I really, in, in the run up for Cape Epic, but even prior to that, knowing that Cape Epic was on the horizon, I knew I had to dial my fueling because I was going to have to do something that was multiple hours a day, many days in a row. So it became very real for me, especially knowing that I, I have a history of cramping and Chris, cramping wasn't the motivation. It was fueling. that was the motivation, but it led me to a point where I was looking at 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour as a, as a base. I used to just kind of fly by the seat of my pants. I made sure I had enough food based on how long I thought I was going to be out that day. And I would, this is embarrassing to admit, I would wait till I was hungry. And that is absolutely the wrong, absolutely the wrong way to go, especially if you're doing work. So I've, I've gotten past that and every ride I've done, and I've done some five and six hour rides, uh, geez, even in the last few months, I've made sure that I have at least 60 grams on my body, in my body per hour. That's, that's my base. Now, this is the single thing that has changed. Nothing else, nothing else is identifiable. So again, it, theoretical is just what makes me believe it, that if there's something to anything that anything has to be how I've approached my nutrition, the change <laughs> in how I approach my nutrition. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So the, the $64,000 question then is could calcium induced muscle contraction and relaxation connect to exercise associated muscle cramping and, and therefore could glycogen, glucose, carbohydrate be a cause of cramping? Could it be the cause? Probably not, but a boy can dream. So Ortenblad 2011 <laughs> noted that low glycogen may decrease the sarcoplasmic reticulum rate of calcium release. So translated fatigue due to low muscle glycogen leads to less calcium release, leads to weaker muscle contraction. And that's on the contraction side of things. But then the Allen paper that I mentioned earlier says skeletal muscle fatigue is generally accompanied by a marked slowing of relaxation as well. So knowing this, why not employ all the amazing advances we have in imaging technology to explore a potential link between glycogen content and utilization and these EAMCs? And this is done more and more commonly already with different respects. I mean, we've learned certain things like we now know that there are three primary storage depots within the muscle for glycogen. So we've got the intramyofibrillar, the intermyofibrillar right within it, the sarcolemmal, so around the muscle cell itself. So th that's an important learning in and of itself. And I could get in the weeds on that too. There's a lot of interesting stuff there. Also learn that glycogen is not evenly distributed, which makes me wonder, is it possible to train where the glycogen consolidates, et cetera? Uh, it's just, just a ton of questions. And before moving on to, to how I'm going to close this out, I do want to make it clear that I'm not looking to be right here. This isn't, this isn't, I have a point to make and I want everyone to agree with me. Rather, this is inspired by personal experience. Something has changed or uh, cramps have disappeared. And I'm trying to piece together why that is, because I think there might be something beneficial in here. And I'm hoping if nothing else to inspire research, maybe someone listens to this, who is a grad student or a PhD or a researcher and says, you know what, mm, there might be something there. And in support of everything I've put forth so far, which is entirely anecdotal, let's look at and mechanistic. I do have a little bit of non-anecdotal support for my hypothesis. Um, one thing is that the muscle fibers can fatigue without any major slowing of this relaxation. So basically they go, they fail, new fibers are cycled in. And this is especially applicable to slow twitch fibers. This leads me to believe that the fast twitch fibers are our culprits, are the culprits in, in the case of muscle cramps. We cook the slow twitch fibers with duration and we, we deplete their glycogen stores. Fast twitch fibers are recruited and eventually we, we deplete them as well. You know, whether that's due to insufficient carbohydrate pre, during, post, uh, too high of exercise intensity, you know, the glycogen replenishment outpaces utilization, don't know. Put another way though, if ATP is responsible for muscle relaxation and ATP is derived from sugar, and we run out of sugar, could sugar be behind cramps or at least part of the picture? Another study pointed out that reactive oxygen species plus duration can also reduce calcium uptake. So think about when we, when, when we go for a long time, we're, we're basically oxidizing fuel, producing oxidants. These ROS, uh, these reactive oxygen species climb, calcium uptake declines. So there's more calcium in the cytosol, which you know, could lead and mechanistically does to sustain muscle contraction. So the translation here is that longer rides mean more aerobic work, mean more reactive oxygen species, more oxidants and less calcium uptake. Importantly though, there, there are a slew of studies that show that muscle fibers can accumulate calcium with little change in the calcium content in the muscle. And, and this does help me recognize that 
calcium accumulation does not necessarily have to be an issue, but they, a number of them point out, except when exercise was very prolonged. And what are we talking about here? I mean, when do cramps typically occur? Personally, they rarely occur during short workouts, no matter how intense I make them. This is always after multiple hours of exercise, which you know provides further opportunity for you to get your nutrition wrong. So to wrap all this up, whether you agree or disagree with what I've put forth here, sufferers of exercise associated muscle cramps really have nothing to lose by moving themselves closer to optimal fueling strategies. I mean, why not do it? And if in the process you happen to eliminate cramping issues, well, it's a double win. So wrapping back here to Wilson, uh, hopefully Wilson, you're listening to this in a non-cramped state <laughs> and you're not dealing with this. Uh, I wonder Wilson, what your fueling uh, rate is typically on the bike and then what you're taking in off the bike, particularly leading into training sessions, um, with, a uh, one to two meals prior to that. Uh, how you're going to, if you're going to bed in a deprived state, or if you're going to bed in a, in a nourished state, it doesn't have to be overnourished, right? Just a nourished state, all those things that, that would all be areas that I would be looking at, uh, Wilson. Now you may be at 90 grams an hour. You may do all that stuff. And going back to what a lot of the researchers said cramps are, and like Chad is saying here, they are multifactorial. Like th there, there are so many different things going on. So it may be one of the many other things, but like you said, Chad, what do you have to lose by mm -hmm. optimizing your carbohydrate intake or optimizing your sodium intake or optimizing the amount of rest you're doing and the proper training and preparation for your goal event? There's all these things. Exactly. And all those better. things, all those things carry the benefits that you're searching for anyway. So improvements in those could yield improvements in other things. For me, mm -hmm. improvements in my fueling strategy perhaps yielded an elimination of exercise, exercise induced cramps. It certainly seems like a better strategy to take, to look at those areas for improvement rather than just living in fear, knowing it's going to happen and having pickle juice on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, there, there's just like, nothing you know. to lose, right? Improve your feeling yeah. and you're going to be a, 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 a higher performing athlete anyway. Yeah. So why not? Yep. Yeah. I, I didn't experience a single cramp at Cape Epic and I did not expect that. Like, and you were on top of your fueling the whole time. This is another thing yep. that lent support for in my head for my hypothesis here. Yeah. That's like, I'm particularly proud of that. I hit 110 grams an hour, like clockwork on that bike. And if I finished at three and a half hours, I still was fueling just like I was going on. It wasn't like, I was like, hey, I got a half hour left. I'll just stop mm -hmm. at three hours of fueling at uh, my fueling plan. No, I kept going. I just kept yeah, that, going. That particular tactic has bit me in the butt. I can't tell you how many times. Oh. You, I mean, you figure I'm an hour out from home. I just had a gel. That's 20 grams of carbohydrate. I'm going slow. I should be able to get there when not recognizing the deficit that you've built up over the course of that ride. That's super tempting, right, Alex, especially in like cross country <clears throat> Olympic or geez, any race, because the end is always really intense and you feel like you really have to focus on everything else, but you can't, it's, it's a temptation. It always exists, but you can't do it. Yeah. I think, I don't know. Just stay on top of it the whole time is hard. Like, I think that's, <laughs> why people say early and often is more just to kind of make up for those gaps. So it's mm -hmm. not always going to be able to reach for something. But dude, I, it, also think well, about professional writers who have to do long days every day and they have to be on top of their fueling. There's not a real high prevalence of muscle cramps. You don't, you don't see too much of it, but when you do see it, it's when at least I, I see mm -hmm. riders who get away in a break. They're opportunistic. They're maybe not really suited to be in the break they're in, but it's an opportunity they can't pass up. They've built themselves into a situation where they're probably not thinking about fueling. They're thinking about hanging in there, doing their work, the opportunity that's in front of them that, that I could actually pull this off today. I think it's those situations that create the little slips where you're not paying attention to, I'm not getting my 60, 80, 90 grams per hour. Mm -hmm. I'm just focused on the task at hand. I'm thinking those back. are the guys who end up cramping. Yep. More, Sorry, more often than not, people are <laughs> actually impressed more by how much I eat than how fast I go like off the bike too. Mm -hmm. Like my brother and I went to the Leadville stage race together and did that. And he's like, just, just make me what you normally make. And so I made him dinner. It's like, oh man, ate half of it. <laughs> made him pancakes in the morning and I have two and then he ate one. And he's just like, I don't understand how you eat that much. And I on the bike too. Like I'm reaching into my pocket probably every 15 minutes, like even on endurance days. Think we've done the math on this before but my endurance days are roughly 800 kjs an hour so if i'm riding for four hours it's 3200 kjs so 
I'm, I'm maxing out even on those days. Mm-hmm. That's so more I than think. what most people eat in a day that you do mm-hmm. in that one ride. You know, yeah. It is like, that's put that into context. Imagine eating all three of your meals and everything else that you eat all in that space of four hours on that bike. That's why, that's why it's so hard. Like uh, we're actually got a, got a question in the live chat right now about how do you calculate your optimal grams per hour? And honestly, I don't know what the optimal rate is. It seems that to be something that's uh, trainable and adaptable within reason. And depending on the individual, uh, there's not enough research around that. And that's something I know, like we mentioned his name very regularly, but Dr. Podlegar is really interested in figuring this out. Like what are the points of diminishing returns and how trainable is it? And what are the harms in overdosing? I mean, if we're just talking about a couple hours on the bike, getting 40 extra grams, you know, you're used to 60, but you do 40, you're used to 80, but you do 120. What's the downside of that? Worst Mm -hmm. case, a little bit of gastric distress. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of people think of it. Might be able to get used to it. So like, yeah. like at first, when you step it up, it's common to experience gastric distress if you take big leaps, but if you work your way up, it's not too bad. But I, you know, if you have a really low, uh, if you, if you have a low FTP or a better said, instead of low FTP, low, low power output potential in the sense that you, you just don't create as much, you don't produce as much work, right? So you might have 150 watt FTP. That's the way that we can quantify this, Right. In that case, yeah, you might not need to take in 160 grams an hour or something like that. I don't know. But is it bad to take it in? I also don't know the answer to that. Like if you're taking all of that in, it might be beneficial. It's I think we're pretty clear on what happens when we don't take enough in. So why not Mm -hmm. veer toward the other side? We're not talking about living this way. We're talking about the next ride you do. See what happens when you up your intake by 20 grams an hour. Yes. Yeah. Alex, I cut you off. You're going to say something. I just think it goes back to not dieting on the bike. And then even back to the first question of lowering your FTP, the lower the FTP, I'm always jealous of people who have lower FTPs with the same watch for kilo because yeah. they can actually fuel their work. Oh but yeah. 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 Like when I'm peaking at like four ten, like we'll do rides. Like I did some for marathon worlds. That was a 300 watt average for five hours. So <laughs> I'm burning 5,500 kjs. There's absolutely no way I'm feeling that no matter how much carb I take in per hour. Hmm. So it's like, I'm yeah. always jealous of people who could ride five hours and get close to fueling that. Yeah. So I always think about like, I, I know Felipe Gana's times are so amazing gonna say. on a TT bike and his power. I think of that, like being able to produce all that power crazy. But every time I see one of his rides and I see the power, all I think of is how hard that would be to eat that much. Oh, like yeah. you can't, you, you simply can't, you can't take it in. Like he, yeah. he burns 800 KJs in 20 minutes when yeah. he's flying which sorry, we're really going off the rails here, but welcome, just welcome to my mind. Um, which is why, uh, we get into this whole like debate of fat max utilization and really driving toward that and, and optimizing that for athletes that are so far from getting optimal intake in terms of glycogen, in terms of what they need to be able to take in and utilize and burn on the bike. So we have this principle with an athlete like Filippo Ghana, I can only assume has to by necessity have a pretty impressive fat max and a really good ability to be able to metabolize fat when he's on the bike and metabolize anything when he's on the bike. Cause he simply can't have enough. Like the supermarket shelves are empty. They're cleared out when he is on his bike. Right. So, whereas for most average folks, those shelves are well stocked yet. We have somebody saying, let's push them toward fat max. That's where we can make the most gains. Absolutely. Don't get me wrong. It's good to be aerobically efficient, but when we're talking about what really drives the needle, many times there's lower hanging fruit that can really help athletes. And it gets us so far out of the, um, out of this realm, out of this perspective of dieting on the bike, which is so prevalent. And it's like we mentioned before, it's a temptation for all of us all the time. We feel like we should, eh, do I really need to take that in? Take it in, uh, what you are eating on the bike when you are training that sort of stuff. It's not the, that does not make you fat. You are fueling work. You are changing the way that your body is made. It's made to do work. So super like interesting the, thoughts that come from the this. hybrid yeah. simile, where if you have a hybrid car and it's both electric and gas, you're not just going to not stick gas in it because it has an electric motor. If, yes. if you need gas to go over 60 miles an hour, you better have gas in your car. Hmm. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great analogy for it. Mm-hmm. So Chad, thanks for the food for thought, the interesting, uh, a deep dive into cramps. Once again, they are multifactorial. However, that doesn't mean that we can't explain or explore those factors. Right. So, and this is a really interesting one to look at. Uh, if you 
have increased your carbohydrate intake and noticed uh, uh, your cramps not going away, or if you've noticed your cramps going away with that, let us know. It'd be really interesting to know. You can let us know in comments down below on YouTube. Uh, let us know what you think makes you cramp. We can talk all about it. It'll be interesting. Yeah, I do. And it's easy to lose sight of too, because I've been increased my carbohydrate intake and my performance has just improved. Right. And I feel better and I can ride better the next day. And I can lift in the morning when I'm usually just wasted after a long ride the day prior, all these things have distracted me from the fact that I haven't had cramps in this long period of time. That's why I had to sit back and think, man, how long has it been? Because hmm. you see all the other benefits and you lose sight of something that just, just reared its head, ugly head every hmm. once in a while. One quick pro tip too. Last one. Uh, at the end of Cape Epic, if I ever got to the point where I felt like, oh, I have a little bit more left in the bottle or I have that gel left uh, because we are planning, we always plan to have more nutrition than, because you plan nutrition based on time out on course. Uh, so in some cases, the courses ended up being shorter than we anticipated, or we just rode faster than we anticipated. And in those cases, I still took in that extra nutrition that I had. I would nail my 110, but then afterward I would take that in because I knew that the next day there were more important things. And I definitely didn't want to be on the shy side of things. So, That's okay. Great point. That, Often yeah. I'll grab a gel as I'm rolling down the hill to my house, just mm -hmm. not, not necessarily for today. And I think we get so wrapped up in like mm -hmm. fueling these 90 minutes, but it's, it's the next day and the day after that. And the day after that, that it really makes a difference. The consistency isn't going to help you one day. And I think it's easy to fall in the trap. Same with like sleep and stuff like that. Like, Oh, I slept six hours, but I still hit my numbers. It's like, yeah, maybe you can do it once, but try not to do that as a regular thing. Same with fueling the consistency is, will pay off. It's funny. It's one of those small things that successful athletes like you do, Alex, that you take for granted and you think that eh, it's, you know, it just is what it is, mm -hmm. but it's those sort of small habits that really allow an athlete to be able to build day after day, training block after training block season after season. Uh, it's when you deprive yourself like that, that you just make it really unnecessarily hard. So let's get into some rapid fire stuff. And Rachel, you win an award because you submitted some so fantastic good. ones. She says rapid fire round one, ready, go. Is it wrong for a vegetarian to eat animal crackers? No, <laughs> this is funny. <laughs> I think I'm too logical for this one. They're, they're vegan. Well, the, the original brand is both vegan and vegetarian. So I'm going to go with no. I'm going to say, yes, it is because it's symbolically savage. So uh, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I think it's Just wrong. Turn them over. Yep. Uh, next one, Taylor, uh, fill in the blank. Taylor Swift is blank. Popular. I don't know anything. About Taylor Swift. <laughs> not, a, not, a, are you, yeah. Not familiar with T Swift very much. I, I know who she is, but Sir. I don't know anything about her besides she sings a lot about relationships. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll take that. She, basically useless unless oh, she gosh. allows a member of the greatest band ever the national to produce her album or does a collaboration with someone like bon Iver or someone who uh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. dresses her up a bit mm, there we go okay uh i will say taylor swift is a marketing genius that's what i mm. will say uh texting or talking which do you prefer texting for sure while talk is wait <laughs> <laughs> as we talk for two hours <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, i guess it depends i don't know if i can choose both but it depends on the situation for informational stuff texting but i call my mom every week and it wouldn't be the same if i just texted her hmm. yeah i can see that like more important stuff i, I call yeah like if i don't if i don't have like a set agenda i guess text because i can handle communication asynchronously and i like that uh mm -hmm. most embarrassing nickname you've had <laughs> I don't, I don't really have it. My, my mom called me Alzi or still does, I guess Alzi. some, some would consider that embarrassing, but I don't know. I was never I one get, to get embarrassed by my parents. So yeah, I just get distortions of my name. If I felt this were a real safe place, I might share like a, 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 a wound <laughs> <childhood> <laughs> experience. <laughs> but I, I don't, Nate's not here. With, with, no, fine. no, no. With the three of us, <laughs> with the three of us, it is, but a lot of people are going to listen to this and I don't uh -huh. want to open myself up to that. So, yeah. uh, it's just like Chet Herman. Cause I'm Chad Herman. <laughs> I get okay. Chaz a lot. Uh, chat. <laughs> Chaz. Good chat. Chat. <laughs> Chaz no is hilarious. I, I crack up. Chaz, I quite like. He gets actually. it so often too, and I just crack up every time. We had a full conversation with one of you, um, podcast listener. You were listening, or you were talking to us at Kona one year, 
and you spoke to Chad as Chaz for maybe a 30 minute conversation. And it was fantastic. I was grinning inside every time. So like legitimately uh, thought your name was Chaz or, or just to I, think rip so. you. I don't know. I don't know. It confused quite, me. It was, sure. it was wonderful though. It's great. Um, hmm, I don't know if I have a truly embarrassing one. My sister called me the underwear man when I was a kid. So I don't know why. I guess that still that. fits, right? <laughs> Racing XC and all. That's true. Yeah. I go around in a onesie all the time. Okay. Um, last song you bought. Oh, man. Well, I mean, I, we don't really buy think, music that often these days. I think the last song I bought had to be Aaron Carter, like way back. I think it was a CD. Aaron, Aaron Carter. Carter. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I paid so. for a lifetime membership to a download site maybe uh-huh. 10 years ago and I split it with someone that's ethical, but I, <laughs> I, I still use it. They're still in business. I really thought they would be a fly by night, but they're, they still, they're still there. So if I actually download something and keep it in my possession, you know, rather than just listen to Spotify, yeah, I, I get it from there. So I, I pay, I guess by now each song probably costs like point oh 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 one <laughs> cents. Yeah. The original yeah. NFT song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The the last song that I bought, I can't remember the actual name of the song, most likely, but it was from my friend who's an artist, Jordan Moyes. Uh he's a singer songwriter. He was on American Idol too. Listens to oh, this cool. podcast. Great guy. Um, <laughs> but uh yeah, he's I always buy his stuff. I would go out of my way to do that. All right. Invisibility or super strength? Invisibility. Super strength. 100 percent Ooh. <laughs> watch, things bro. You can do it's with all invisibility. about the watch <laughs> that's true yeah understandable for alex yeah Thing oh, I, I, won't make me go faster <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's true yeah, yeah uh i would pick i would pick super strength as well it would have more broad application to the things in my life i would think and my son would think it's super cool if i'm invisible he wouldn't think that's very cool so uh okay uh, let's get it. This one says, which equipment upgrade have you made in the last year that has delivered the greatest ROI, whether speed performance or just pure enjoyment? Um, I've got a couple, but they only relate to strength training. There's a company called Kabuki strength and they make mm. unusual bars. They have one called a Cadillac bar, which is uh-huh. uh, basically three different hand positions, but they're all in a neutral grip. And my bench press goal used to be like, 225 and i thought i would never get there well let's just say my new bench press goal is 275 and i do think oh, because snap. it allows me that. <laughs> <laughs> it allows me to, to move in on the back. a certain way that, that honestly i don't have any shoulder issues anymore and i didn't realize that benching with a straight bar was was that big of a deal apparently is they also make something called a duffalo bar which is kind of a convex or a rounded barbell for mm. for squats in fact i'm not sure you could use it for anything else but it's incredible how much that has elevated my squat game too. It's more comfortable on the back. Your arms are in a more friendly position, which means your shoulders, your shoulder blades are in a better position, but they just think a little bit outside of the box in terms of, you know, actually carrying heavy loads and they make some mm-hmm. very cool equipment. Hmm. Alex, how about you? I'm going to use this opportunity for a shameless sponsor plug. Uh, I just got the hammerhead crew too. And I freaking love that thing. Yeah, I, for the longest time, I've just felt like head units are just behind the times. Like you look at your iPhone, right? And it's like, mm-hmm. it's got all this capability, not, not crazy, more expensive than a head unit. And it's like, then you look and I'm not ripping on them for, you know, each their own, but you look at like a Garmin or, um, a Wahoo, the Wahoo, especially for me, just looks like you should play snake on it. And it's just like, some people love that simplicity again, not knocking it, but me personally loving tech. And I just thought there was so much room for improvement in the head unit space. And I think hammerheads kind of taking that up, you get upgrade, you get, um, firmware pushed your device every two weeks and they crowdsource like the, the stuff that they're going to work on. Mm. Pretty cool. cool. Noted. Yeah. Tubalite t- or just tire inserts, but tubalite inserts are the ones I use. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Like would never consider you, not running them. So yeah, do you use them on XC too? That's a big deal. Oh Yeah. Yes, a hundred percent front and rear. I don't understand the having it on one and not the other. I think that what that is, is that's a temporary shift for a lot of people that are trying to get over like weight and they're worried mm-hmm. about it. I think that those inserts weigh 28 grams each. So like, that's, um, you're not going to notice that. Um, that's a really small amount. I and then the benefits that you get are just through the roof in terms of being able to carry momentum through chunky stuff. 
because you can run lower pressure. And then you have like, you're basically, if you think of it in terms of an air spring, you're making it more progressive, your tires. So it means that you can have more initial suppleness and still have all the resistance that you need later on. And then on top of that, you have a noodle in there that's going to stop you from hitting your rim. Allows and you, to you run. use those on the new control SLs as well? Yes, I do. Even though those wheels say that they're not designed to work with inserts, my only assumption is that means that they were not designed in conjunction with them, as in like these are not tested with that. That was not our intent is that they were to be used with these. However, Correct. doesn't necessarily mean that you can't put an insert inside of them and ride with them. I may be voting Absolutely. a warranty. And if I am, don't follow my lead. I apologize. But uh, they are incredible. I would never consider not running them. And people are like, well, what if you get a flat? You can just wrap the thing around you and you're fine. But your flats are going to go down by so much with a, mm -hmm. with running inserts too. I don't know why everybody doesn't run them, particularly in cyclocross. Like what in the world it helps. Like you can run such low pressure and then it keeps your tire on the bead. There's like <laughs> so many benefits. I don't know. Are there any benefits core, I get they're a pain to install and I don't think they deliver the same benefits. I've ran them and I don't like them near as much as the just simple, like even basic pool noodle ones that you can get. So mm. Yeah. And they help the bead stay on like they they would decrease blow out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I ran 12 and 13 PSI this year mm -hmm. at Cape Epic on two days. And then I ran, I think 14, 15 was it uh, on the normal days is what I was running on the muddy days. I ran that and I was like going into berms hard like yeah, and not rolling. Yeah. So, you know, when you really ride hard and your tires get the cross hatching on the mm -hmm. side of them, that means that you are really flexing your tire and it kind of looks like your tire might be dusty, but then it looks like your tire has X's around the outside. And that X all that pattern is where you have reinforced fibers within that tire, the sidewall of the tire, those remain strong. Whereas the rest of the tire flexes. And for some reason it causes this differential in how dirt sticks to your tire and dust. Yep. So that's how, you know, you're pushing the sides of your tires. And that's when you could be risking blowing a tire off the bead and absolutely no issues ever getting a tire to burp. I haven't had a tire burp <laughs> once without before tires burped all the time. Well, I don't, I don't push turns as hard as you do, but I am a 200 pound rider and I've been running somewhere between 16, 17, maybe 18 PSI. And I've <laughs> dipped below that on a couple of cases and it's just <laughs> amazing. Thanks yep. to inserts. Yep. But before we move on, I want to play the Jonathan role for your PSIs. Jonathan, can you repeat them and wait? Cause I know a lot of people ask me pre pressure yes. questions. <clears throat> yeah. So 12 and 13 PSI with Revol control SLs. Those are 30 millimeter internal width. Uh, the tires that I'm running are, uh, Maxis Aspen 2.4s. Those are the XO casing. I'm not fancy. I don't get the unobtainium tires that, that pros get. So that's just normal tire. And in that situation, in muddy conditions, I ran 12 and 13 PSI. I never once rimmed out, or in other words, you feel it when your rim hits the ground. Uh, in drier conditions, I would run 14 to 15. In our area, I'll run 15 to 16, typically, or sometimes slightly below. And that's because we have very big rocks that come up very suddenly. And at times, you want to have a bit more protection. And we also have uh, really sandy conditions. So it's not quite as crucial to get a really fat contact patch when you have sand, whereas if it's hard pack, you want more of a contact patch. And I'm yeah. hundred and at that race at Cape Epic with all the water and everything else I was taking in, probably 150 pounds. It came into the race around 148, but I assume 150. Perfect. So we have so much more rapid fire, but we don't have time. I feel like we have to save some of these uh, for, for a future episode. So uh, let's get into listener questions. This one's from Dan. He says, I've a uh, long time listener, first time caller. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate that. And you can go to trainerroad.com slash podcast to submit any and all questions you have. We'd love to hear from you. He says, I've recently hit a bit of a training rut. After a great year of growth, going from FTP of 230 to 276, work-related travel has again increased, work stress is high, and I've added strength training as another variable into my training plan, all of which has resulted in some workout failures. He's saying this in quotes where he needs to bump down the, the intensity in order to complete a workout. I haven't completed a new ramp test to reset my FTP as I just don't want to. Now I know what I'm capable. Now that I know of what I'm capable of, this is talking exactly to what we were talking about with your off season, right? Alex, I've achieved a PR. I don't want to bump my FTP down. That's my all time high score. I don't want to sit below that. Absolutely. However, and this is a continuation of Dan's question. However, 
I'm not doing workouts that are at the level, uh, or I'm, I am now doing workouts that are at the level of 1.9 to three. So once again, we talked about workouts, having workout levels and adaptive training brings you through those at your own rate. He says, I'm happy with adaptive training suggestions. I now have workouts that are moderate to hard yet achievable. And it's great. And I'm again, excited and motivated to make progress. That's really good to hear. That's the whole point of it. He says, however, I'm curious to know if there is a, and he says in quotes here, because this is not to be conflated with the power zone, but a sweet spot of workout levels. In other words, is doing a level four to eight workout more efficient for growth than doing a level one to three or on the other side, a nine to 10. Another way to ask the question, should I retest and lower my FTP such that I'm doing higher level workouts or leave the FTP where it is? Psychologically, I prefer this <laughs> and do level one to three workouts. Doesn't matter. I'm a classic overthinker. Dan couldn't tell you're an overthinker at all. Uh, had no, had no idea. <laughs> so welcome to the club of overthinkers. Uh, it's a crowded room for in the cyclist realm. So, uh, to answer this one very directly, but then I want to get into some of the more, like the thoughts that we've had and chat, I'll ask you on this, but first, uh, you are still going to get benefits of adaptive training, whether you're training at levels one to three or whether you're training at levels eight to 10. That said, if you're looking at how to get the most out of it, then yes, absolutely. Getting a good fix on where you're at with your threshold right now would be very helpful. Just gets you in a sweet spot so that you'll be working on things. In most cases, you'll see that as workout levels get higher, rest between intervals might get shorter. Interval duration might extend. Interval intensity within that power zone may increase. So if you are always training at a really high threshold, but you are not and it's too high for what you are, and you're just training at low level workouts, you may never achieve the actual ability to be able to hold that power for durations that matter on race day. And that's what we're really trying to do is prepare you for whatever matters, whether it's racing or whether it's not a race, just a general goal, but extending your ability to be able to put out power at a specific duration. Um, uh, people call this time to exhaustion very often. And it's something that this takes into account. Uh, or uh, reducing the amount of rest required in between efforts. All of those things are very important um, aspects of a fit cyclist. So you will miss out on those if you are training with too high of an FTP to a certain extent. That said, if you continue with it, eventually you'll get there. Um, but if your FTP is way too far off, then yeah, maybe you won't get there. Maybe you'll just uh, always be working behind. So yeah, assess or just drop it down, whatever you want to do, Dan. If you don't want to take a test, I can understand that. Just drop it back down and don't be afraid to drop it down low. It feels like going back on a video game and playing everything on easy mode after you played it on hard. And uh, that can be motivating and can help you. So as particularly with all the work stress that you have, but Chad, this is common, right? I mean, you've been coaching athletes and working on this for a long time for athletes to not want to drop down. What have you typically, what would you typically advise in this case for Dan to do? Kind of the same thing that I think is the driving force behind adaptive training, which is we want to make this effectively progressive. So, the, I mean, the progressive, the progressive nature of it, progression itself is, is the key to all of this. And I don't know how you can expect to progress when you're basically avoiding reality. I mean, your threshold is what it is. And then we try to grow that threshold or we try to grow your capabilities within specific energy systems relative to your discipline over the course of workouts. One workout leads to the next out workout leads to the next workout. And you're kind of describing a situation of stagnation where you're basically hovering between two and three. We need to progress you into four, five, six, seven, and eight in order for you to get faster, elevate that threshold, retest that threshold, be happy with <clears throat> excuse me, with that new number, because you inevitably will, if it, if it goes up and, you know, if at some point you have to face that hard truth of I've temporarily lost some fitness, just focus on the temporary part of that description. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not forever. It, it, it ebbs and flows. Just like Alex says, I mean, he comes into an off season, you take some time off the bike, fitness is going to suffer a little bit, but chances are that, that, that bit of reduction in what you're capable of is, is going to be rewarded with a further increase next season. And even if it doesn't, you need it anyway, but the point is you we're looking to progress your capabilities and we can't progress your capabilities when you're in a holding pattern and you're avoiding reality. Mm -hmm. You spoke about this earlier, Alex, but is there anything else that you would want to add uh, just perhaps with Dan's context? Yeah, I have a few comments on it. First, first thing I look at is 230 versus 276. If you have it set to 276 and the system has you do a sweet spot effort, you're really doing VO2. So <laughs> I, 
I understand the psychological asset of it, I guess, aspect of it from the face, but I feel like that's much easier than failing a bunch of workouts, you know, like mm-hmm. failure is part of it, but it's like, if you're continually hitting the wall, I feel like that would be more mentally degrading than anything else, Agreed. but mm-hmm. also I'm definitely one who falls in this trap and I'm sure a lot of listeners are, but you have to separate FTP from performance. Like it's definitely a driving factor, but if your FTP on paper is 276 or 230, your performance is the same. Like if you went out and did a race the next day, it doesn't matter what that number says because the true test is actually trying to ride. And so if you think of it that way, like I want to be the fastest on my group ride, or I want to be the fittest I can be, or I want to target this race in all those scenarios, the best thing you can do is have an accurate number to train off of, to make sure your, your systems are accurate and you're not digging yourself a hole, regardless of the number it says, regardless of your watts per kg, that what I'm trying to get at is, is your physical work that you're capable of in this moment doesn't change when you change that number. But if you change it to a more accurate number, the, the athlete you can be in a month, in two months, in six months, in a year is so much greater than trying to train to this number. That's not real. Yeah. Yeah. And, and psych- psychologically, I would love to go back to an FTP of 380 Watts. <laughs> but <laughs> psychologically I, I get that. A 400 watt oh, ftp rider <laughs> i couldn't do an endurance workout man it would, it would bury me <laughs> yeah exactly and and i want to be clear on something too uh, alex uh, mentioned the fact that if you're failing workouts constantly then that would not be good and how adapted training will view that when you turn down the intensity is it will look at that and say okay this rider was not capable of doing this work therefore we don't want to give this rider harder workouts we will want to give this rider find a, a workout that's closer to this athlete's capabilities. So if you're continually failing workouts, your, your progression rate will be slower. Um, almost inevitably, that's just the way it'll work. And if you're constantly giving yourself work, that's just out of your reach, then that's fine. Yeah. Like detach yourself from FTP. Like that is not you. That's also not your performance. Like your performance is something else. Yes. Not your self-worth. Uh, let that be, look, look at that as like, look at your FTP as how can I get the most out of my training? That's like the best way to look at it. And the most does not mean more getting the most from your training means it's well calibrated. So that's why you'd want a good representative threshold so that you can get the most out of what you're doing. Most isn't more. It's just right. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, let's go into Ken's question. He says, I'm a 59 year old recreational rider. And he says, uh, restarted training 18 months ago. So I assumed that you had ridden prior to that, Ken, but in this case, restarted training 18 months ago and embraced interval training plans. I'm assuming that you are following trainer roads plans, Ken, since you're writing to us, you're talking about this, but maybe not. Um, but that said that that'll be our assumption. He says, I'm having great results. My FTP went from 200 to 250, my weight from 175 to 147. And he says nearly a 50% improvement in power to weight ratio. And I'm breaking climbing PRs that are 10 years old, but I have now plateaued both weight loss and FTP improvement. My goals are to build more power and keep improving my times, especially on the climbs and to kill my next century. His goal is to break six and a half hours on an 8,000 foot climbing day. So where to next? Have I reached my limit on power and just focus on endurance now? Um, Chad, this sounds like a situation, I mean, 18 months, I I don't know if he trained all the way through 18 months nonstop Mm -hmm. or what he was doing there. Um, What are your thoughts on addressing Ken? Sure. If I were, if I were working with a 59 year old athlete who over the course of 18 months went from 200 to 250 and dropped 20 plus pounds or 20 ish pounds, (laughs) 30 ish pounds. Good Lord. Uh, I would say your ceiling's nowhere near. I, I mean, yes, you are older and, and there's, you know, maybe you just skyrocket right it up to your genetic potential, but I think that's unlikely. I, I would hold out hope that you just need to do all the right things. You know, what, what Jonathan's already noted here, you're going to have to periodize your training. You're going to have to celebrate your, your recovery phases, uh, set goals, do all the things, but I, I think you still have quite a lot of room to grow Ken. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, Alex, sorry, I, I don't want to jump in if you have something to add there too. Oh, yeah. Um, I just look at this in terms of what else you can optimize. Um, Ken, I don't know your body type, so I don't know what 147 looks like on you, but like Chad said, that's 
an impressive improvement and congrats to you. Um, that's the dream, right? Weight goes down and power goes up. Like <laughs> you're the <laughs> unicorn, my friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so if, if 147 is like lean, like I would stop kind of focusing on that facet of it and, and start focusing on power. And we talked about a few things and we talk about it a lot on here, but fueling is a huge piece, you know, analyze your carbohydrate intake. Are you fueling rides properly? Um, taking some time off. If you've been training those 18 months straight, going back to that two weeks off, it'll, it'll help you both mentally and physically. You'll see drops in the short term, but it'll give you more ceiling for potential gain in the long term. And then just the consistency, like, I don't know how long you took off, but you said restarted training. So coming back to it, it'll take a little bit to get that going. It could be even longer than 18 months. And some of those adaptations are, are longer than others, but I could say with 90, 95% confidence, you're not at your ceiling. There's other things to optimize and there's, there's more improvements to be had. And then as far as goal to break 6.5 hours on an 8k foot day, you can look at things outside of performance, aero helmet, you know, clothing is a huge one. Like everybody loves to talk about aero bikes and aero wheels, but clothing is a time and time again, shown to be the biggest difference. So you can look at things like that when you're looking at just pure time over a course. So again, FTP is one thing, weight is one thing, but they're, they're parts of a bigger picture to go fast on a bike. If you saw this amount of improvement, Ken, in 18 months, then clearly your training is working for you, right? Um, there's no, no reason to say that it was not working for you. That said, being 59 years old, uh, and I don't know what the other responsibilities you have in your life uh, bring in terms of stress to your life, but uh, in most cases, as you get older, you do need to you know, adjust or progress at a different rate than you would have when you were younger. And that's what adaptive training will really help with. And since you probably looking at 18 months ago is when you started training, not sure if you've used it yet, but I'm sure it'll be a huge help for you, uh, particularly for athletes that, uh, are getting up there in years, uh, having some sort of ability to be able to, whether it's VO two abilities we've seen actually tend to be, uh, a bit tougher for some, uh, if they get older or repeatability or extending time at that, it's all very interesting, uh, what we're able to see there, but Adaptive training is going to account for it. So that's a really important piece to make sure that you're not overdoing it. That said, uh, man, I look at this and I just think if, if you didn't give yourself a proper off season, this is another thing, uh, that, you know, you need to periodize your training. You can't just do stuff. That's going to be sp event specific the whole time. Can't just do base training, and expect to get the sort of improvements you want. You need to change up. Uh, this is periodization. One one is that the body needs novel stimulus. And you can focus the body on a specific stimulus stimulus for a certain amount of time to achieve an outcome. And then thereafter, what you do is you lay, you view it all as building blocks where that outcome has been achieved. And that's a great foundation for the next building block and you build and you build, and that's how it works. Once you get to that event, you'll do really event specific stuff. And then thereafter you give yourself some time off to be able to reset and go back to that foundation, revisit it shore up any weaknesses, right? So any cracks that have developed within there, you'll get them all filled in. Uh, you'll maybe add some more blocks onto your foundation. So really basic stuff, Ken, and that's why following a structure plan is really important. There's a temptation that I see that exists for me and it exists for a lot of athletes as well is once you get fast, you don't want to stop using your fastness, if that makes sense. So you don't want to stop racing or you don't want to stop chasing KOMs or crushing souls on that group ride. If that's what you really go for. Um, oh, what you're talking about. Talking yeah, about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's a temptation that causes plateaus all the time. And the thing that's frustrating about it is a lot of the time we look back at all the training we did long before and we say, well, it's the training's fault when really we've probably deviated from any sort of a measured approach. And when instead of what we've been doing is going out and wielding the sword and wondering why, you know, and just focusing on that aspect of it. So it's really important to be honest with yourself and look back at how you've been training. And if you've been following proper periodization to be able to give yourself some time. So be like Alex, take an off season and don't worry about it. Um, and don't then be diligent me. with your training. So <laughs> Find yourself uh, a training plan that like adjusts automatically or something. I heard there's some cool stuff out there that machine <laughs> learns or something. Imagine that, huh? Wouldn't that be yeah. neat? Yeah. Just change trainerroad.com slash AT. <clears throat> yep. Trainerroad.com slash AT. Okay. Chris says, Hey coaches, I'm a big fan of the podcast and I've been using trainer road for a while now and love it. 
My question for you guys is which plan to use in training for Mauna Kea on the island of Hawaii in February of 2022. I chose climbing road race, but after thinking about it, that probably isn't the best choice. Something with much longer sustained efforts around FTP would probably be better. I have a goal of under seven and a half hours for the ride, and this is pretty ambitious, I'll admit, but I think it's doable. I look forward to hearing from you guys. Keep up the great work. Chad, you've done the majority of, or about, I think, two thirds maybe of Mount Ikea. Uh, <laughs> Stress. 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 Yeah, yeah, okay. We're going to continue yeah. on the theme of ripping Chad. All right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, not the theme. Um, so you didn't make it to the top, Chad? Or? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Can you relate a little bit of, so first of all, what would you say to him about the, he says, I chose climbing road race, which climbing road race typically works on maintaining pretty high amounts of power. We're talking about the 10 to 20 minute duration typically is what it's really targeting. It's a specialty plan, right? So that's like, uh, that's where that one is focusing. Is that what you would suggest? Cause Mount Ikea is not a 10 to 20 minute climb. Uh, yeah. what would you suggest of our plans? Is it still called century or is it, uh, do we rename it? Sentry yeah. Plan. Yep. A gravel plan, century plan. They're all really yeah. similar in that regard. Yep. Yeah. Cause basically, I mean, this Grand is all Fondo, about, forgive me is the name of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry. I did yeah. think it got renamed. Mm -hmm. It got renamed. Yeah. The, that, that would be my best. That'd be my recommendation simply because these are really long drawn out, low intensity efforts. I mean, it's, it's basically, what'd you end up doing it in Jonathan? Like 20, I'm looking hours. right now. <laughs> Oh, oh, he back. <laughs> biting back I like no that, he Chad. actually did it so i can't, I can't really <laughs> rib him i'm gonna figure it out here yeah yeah you it's keep like going yeah. hours. either way it was it's a long day it does, i mean if it's five hours three hours then you just need aerobic fitness because you're just gonna have to stay on the gas at a low rate for a long time and if you have the misfortune that we had coming up over the, the saddle saddle road we just got pelted with with block headwind which is really demoralizing when that's pretty much the easiest part of that entire ride. And it probably amounted to, I won't say the hardest, but definitely the hardest of what I made it to. Cause I didn't even make it to the observatory. Uh, so, but, but even then it, it's the same sort of effort. I mean, we're talking about 60% of your FTP, 65, 70%. That's not to say Dad, that you can't ride FTP for seven hours. <laughs> why not i don't have you know <laughs> i need to interject here after that 24 hour cut low six hours six hours and 52 minutes and, know, and 26 it seconds is it impressive, riding is it impressive time in general FTP. yeah <laughs> and the fact that you made it is is impressive in and of itself yeah it was so hard yeah but it's so hard. yeah it's a slow steady effort so mm -hmm. and yeah yeah i'm not saying go out and do slow steady efforts for six or seven or eight hours at a time we we know that you can train a number of ways to improve your aerobic capacity but i don't think there's a heck of a lot to be gained by going climbing road race and working on shorter more intense climbs over doing something like a century plan which is similar in enough ways honestly mm -hmm. it'd probably be a fine approach if you want to mix it up a bit especially if you're you said February, so it's coming up pretty soon. So you got to pick a specialty. Uh, I, I would veer more towards century. Just know it's going to be a long day. It's going to be a low intensity day. And you're going to have to spend a heck of a lot of time in the saddle. And my bit of advice to you is make sure it's the wrong, the, the right saddle, because that was my downfall. That's the, that was the ride that helped me recognize that a slight curve in the middle of a saddle is very different from a flat saddle in, in that it changes your pelvic positioning and puts some heavy stress on your lumbar spine. If that's not the way you're, if that's not the way you ride, if that's not where you're set up. Big day to do a big day to figure that one out too. Not an mm, ideal day so to figure that out. Uh, I also looking at it now, I had uh, 59 Watts for my normalized power. So either I ceased to exist <laughs> <Right> at <FTP. laughs> and I didn't win anything. <laughs> so it was an FTP ever then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or, you know, power meter went bad, which I think is definitely the case. Uh, Chad and I did dip our tires in the ocean, but not our entire bikes. So I don't think that that uh, caused the problem, but Man, um, it look like th this one, like Chad said, yes, a, a higher threshold will help because then your 60% will be at a higher level. Right. But with where you're at in proximity to February, it's going to be about working on tempo intervals and it's going to be sweet spot work and that sort of stuff that really focuses on muscular endurance within still aerobic efforts. And cause that's what it's going to be. It's going to be, I'm just going to prepare you. It's going to be absolutely miserably hard. Um, it's the saddle. Chad and I probably had a 40 mile an hour headwind at times, but probably steady 20. And that was a block headwind while we're climbing up around, you know, eight, six, 8%. And just imagine having that 
just in your face. And then it started raining while we were having that. And the temperature at that point, you're up towards 7,000 feet temperature dropped substantially. And then at the top, it was partially like foggy snowing on us and it was blowing wind. It, it was, it's so hard. Like, yeah, I'm not eager to ever do that again. So, but go for it, Chris. It is a cool accomplishment for sure. Um, to get mm -hmm. that one done. Okay. Last question from Jason. Oh yeah. Go ahead, Alex. Are you I'm ever going to do something like this? This could be you like that. Mm, that's yeah. power to weight ratio, big threshold. So then you can, you know, your 50% would be power? really high. Yeah. yeah. If I did, I, I would try to go for the K1, but I don't know what it is. He fuels well. Oh, let me tell you. He fuels well too, Chad. That's another Wild thing. He's really good at something. fueling yeah. his efforts. Um, the one, so this is from the West side over the Island, not the East side. It's the one that Phil Guyman has the KOM on. He did 459, 459, 19. So just a touch faster than me, you know, just a touch. <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah, 459, 19. Fun. Different kind of yeah. fun. But Chris, mm -hmm. my, my two pieces of advice would be one specificity, even if it's just putting some books under the front tire on your trainer, just to get a little more like mm -hmm. in that position to Chad's point, your saddle's at a different angle when you're climbing for that long. So just make sure you're comfortable with it. And then if you do opt outside, try to do your efforts on a climb. So you're used to that inertia and. And if you have a smart the... trainer, go in a super, the smallest gear you possibly have. Cause boy, inertia was nowhere to be found on the majority mm. of that climb. <laughs> it's so steep toward yeah. the top. So, and then yeah. Chad and John, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I would focus not so much on threshold at this point, but within adaptive training that endurance and tempo like leveling like those two being as close to level 10 between now and february as you can like being really good at those zones within your ftp yep not a bad a idea, idea. Is to swap your weekend ride with a longer ride longer endurance ride it's not a bad idea because and when i say long endurance ride i mean you'll still be riding at 60 to 70 percent of your ftp uh with these longer endurance rides but you'll be trying to extend those durations three hours, maybe four hours. You and know. a good opportunity to test fueling on those rides too. see how your body reacts after mm -hmm. three or four hours to continual yeah. sugar. Some people look at me like I'm crazy because they ask if I eat real food and I'm just pounding gels for seven <laughs> hours and completely <laughs> happy about it. And to give people context, I realize some people may not know, even though we talked about it at length, uh, at length on this podcast, but it goes from sea level literally at the ocean and it goes up to 13,626 feet. I think it is. It's all one climb. Uh, it has the upper section is gravel uh, or not the top. The top, it becomes paved again, but the man from mile and it's 55 miles long. So it's a very long time. And I think that it's gravel basically from mile 46 until mile 54. And it is loose in deep volcanic ash soil that you're trying to deal with. And it is at times it's over 30%, but then it averages, I think it's averages 16% once you get into the gravel and then it goes above. So in my defense, though, I, I did abide my plan, which was to shoot yeah. for the KOM, which is five hours. And if I wasn't there, <laughs> that's it. Hang up the bike. Now I see. Oh yeah. Now I see. Yeah. 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 I like it. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Just okay. Chad with his shiv on the flat section to pull me across. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, and you're dealing with temperatures that are roughly around, depending on when you start, somewhere around 80 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, just humid in the beginning up to Alex freezing. just brought up a, a good point. I don't know if he's doing this solo, but if he is doing it with somebody, there was no teamwork amongst us. We were all such varied abilities that we didn't ride together at all. I don't no. know, Jonathan, did you have somebody for a little while? Didn't you? For a little bit in the beginning. Uh, was there a big great benefit podcast in that listener, or were you pulling him? Uh, he was he was behind, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, But even then, on a climb like that, it's so long and it's so constant. You're, it's going to be really tough to find somebody that would be able to so stick with match. you and work together. Yeah. You know, if you're really going for a KOM, uh, if you're pacing at capacity. So uh, super cool goal to go for. I'm glad I have that one checked because not eager to put it back on. Jason says, how much protein per kilogram do you recommend in a diet? And how should I get this if I'm sticking with a plant-based diet? Also, How's it best to fit strength training in with workouts? And does this impact protein requirements? Uh, Alex, what you're a, you're a noted or you're a well-known food measurer. Um, you, <laughs> I don't know if you measure macros, uh, to that level, yeah, or if you just I measure do. calories. So uh, what do macros, you do? 
Uh, I do 1.9 grams per kilogram. So I'm normally around 68 kilos. So I do about 120 to 130 grams per day of protein. Yep. And then how do you get that in? In terms of what sources do you bring it in from? I cannot help with the plant-based piece of this question, but I personally do eggs, um, meat, uh, rice has a little bit of protein in it and vegetables have a little bit of protein in them. So all, all those combine, I normally spread it out. And then after each workout, I have a mix. I do Gatorade with, um, Bob's whey protein, just unflavored. And I do 20 grams after each workout. Awesome. Uh, 1.8 is typically like the spot where I tell people to shoot, uh, shoot for. So just like Alex was saying there, uh, that's 1.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. So 1.8 grams of protein per kilogram yeah. of body weight. I think the 1.9 for me, sorry to interrupt came from the, like some of my protein, I guess is, is not considered protein in some of these. So like we yeah. talked about it last time with Nate collagen, I take that with my coffee every morning, but it's not a, like a complete protein. So I don't, I count that as when I track, I track the collagen but it gives me some wiggle room to have 1.8 of real protein, if you will, in, in air quotes. Yep. And I'd say 1.8 is kind of like, in most cases, like a, for me personally, it would be a baseline. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be worried if I bumped up above, um, within reason, you know? Yeah. Um, I get a lot of questions on that in the off season too, if I still track and I do, but to make sure I get enough. So to make sure that I'm hitting the minimum of my fat and protein macros, and then that I'm fueling the work that I have, but like you, Jonathan, I'm, I randomly mark January 1st as the day that I kind of start caring, but beyond that, it's just to make sure I get enough. And then anything above that, I'm not, not too concerned with mm -hmm. Chad, uh, what would you say in this case? And I know that you have some information on the plant-based side because it is, it's just inherently more complex. There's no way around it. Right. Uh, when you're talking about sticking to just plants. Yeah. So. I do think 1.8 seems to be the consensus. And I've seen that for masters athletes to bump up to 2.0, 2.2 for strength training athletes, higher than that, depending on what your goals are in terms of adding mass or shedding it. The, uh, something cropped up recently and I haven't had a chance to dig into it, but it actually reduced these requirements. So I can only hmm. just bring it up and, and know that it's something I'll get to. And if there's anything relevant or beneficial there, I'll, I'll do my best to share it. But uh, first off, when it, when it comes to weaving the strength training in, that's another topic I don't want to really touch on today so much as to tease what, what's coming up. There will be a strength training deep dive that much like today's cramping deep dive, will approach it from a new angle, offer some different insight and better direction, some actual, you know, act, some actionables, some, something that you can do that will help you better integrate strength training and some, some pitfalls to avoid that I definitely want to cover. Um, and then when it comes to your protein requirements, I did link to a particular paper by, uh, Berzaga and, and I've come back to this paper a couple of times, only a couple of years old, and it is a review and, and it makes the, the reading, uh, it can send you in a lot of directions, but it does some <laughs> things up quite nicely. I mean, when you, when you look at the end of the paper and the bibliography is 200 studies, and I'm not sure that one's quite this many, it, it cool. gives you a lot of, a lot of room to work work with. Uh, but the, the point is pretty simple and that plant proteins typically aren't as complete as animal-based proteins. Plant-based proteins aren't as, they don't, they don't have the same profile of amino acids and, and you have to have your essentials and then your, your non-essentials come from elsewhere. But unless all 20 amino acids are present, you can't synthesize protein or you can't do it optimally. I, I won't pretend to understand everything about this, but the limitation is that Plant protein is typically incomplete, more so than, than animal protein. And what I like about this paper in particular is that it actually scores different proteins with uh, the term they use. Hang on, I got the paper right here. Super slow. Is uh, It's PDCAA. It's a protein digestibility corrected amino acid score, which is a mouthful, but it's it hits on what's relevant here is how well do you digest the protein? I mean, you can put so much protein in your body, but what does your body get out of it? And this actually the, an interesting note and a total side note, but it talks about chewing efficiency because I think people don't give credit enough credit to how important chewing your food is, especially when it's protein, especially when it's something that the body's already going to struggle to break down effectively. And you're just dosing it into your body in a basically an un, unchewed manner. Uh, and certain, certain people more than others know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Hot chew your damn food. contests. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just chew your food. Give, give yourself You're a like benefit of that. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm not. But uh, the it, it, it points out some interesting things because it scores a lot of these things, uh, like like gluten, for instance. If you're if you're entirely plant-based vegan specifically, then you probably have a reasonably high gluten content and gluten is not a, a highly scored uh, protein and, and things that are, if you're perhaps just vegetarian and if, uh, is it ovo vegetarian when you'll include eggs, mm -hmm. is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. If you include eggs, those are some top notch proteins, at least in the terms of this scoring and in terms of protein availability, amino acid availability, because the, the issue is that if your protein isn't of high enough quality, it gets metabolized like carbohydrate effectively. It gets oxidized. It gets used for energy. It doesn't get used for protein synthesis. And so you're basically, regardless of how much of that protein you think you're taking in, what your body can actually use isn't doing the job for which the protein was meant. Uh, meats aside, milk products are way up on that list, both whey and, and casein, and then egg protein as well. So depending on, you know, how religiously you're sticking to the plant based side of things. If you have a little bit of leeway, a little bit of flexibility, and you can incorporate milk proteins for one egg protein for another, you, you got a lot of, a lot of leverage there. If however, you're entirely on the plant-based side, you have to, you have to look at that. And, and yet another reason why I like this paper is they, they want to, they focus on recommendations for improving your amino acid composition. You're trying to mm. increase its anabolic composition. And they look at specific things like fortifying your plant-based proteins with specific, with specific AAs um, and, and a few other things, but there it's, it provides a lot of actionables and it provides probably pardon the pun, a lot of food for thought in that these are things you may not consider as a vegetarian getting mm. protein as a, a vegetarian, the stricter the vegetarian you are, the harder it is to get sufficient protein, unless you're really paying close attention to it. So start with this paper. It is a review. So it could lead you to many other useful uh, bits of research. Yep. And it's linked down below in the description for this episode. Uh, whether you're listening to this on podcast, joining us on YouTube, I've put it into the live chat as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. What do you guys say? We finish off with a few more rapid fire questions. Sound good? Yeah. Since we didn't get to do all of them. Okay. Rapid fire. We're going to skip round two and go to round three. Rapid fire round three from Rachel. Ready, go. Mario or Zelda? Mario. Zelda. Mario. <clears throat> Never played oh, Zelda. man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. A terrible movie or show that I love is? Gilmore Girls. <laughs> <laughs> I did not take you for a Gilmore Girls fan. Wow. I can't uh, handle girl. the pace of that show. That, uh, the pace of Gilmore Girls like gives me a headache. <laughs> Who speaks that's like a, that? That's a bold sort admission of too. <laughs> <laughs> the dialogue, place, right, it, Chad? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's that safe. That's why, that's why I held back, but get it. Safe has bounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Chad, you said New Girl? New Girl, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a guilty My, pleasure. It's pretty funny though, consistently yeah. so. Mine would be, it's genuinely by every measure, a bad show, but I do not know why I enjoy it still. Like if you look at it, it's just the storylines are not captivating. <clears throat> it doesn't have like, it doesn't have anything. It's burn notice. If any of you have ever yes. seen burn notice, <laughs> like, like I'm sure if you, I, I doubt it's won any Emmys, like, uh, you know, I, I'm sure it hasn't, but is it still going? I don't think so. Okay. But there is a lot of time to burn if you want to follow that one up. No pun intended, but uh, you have plenty of time to burn with that series if you want to watch it. So um, favorite and least favorite food, Thanksgiving food items. Well, that's easy. Favorites, candy, yams. Uh, least favorite is any vegetable. Vegetables don't have a place at Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> just, just let Chad take live. Take that weak sauce off the table right now. <laughs> I wonder if Rachel's the same person that asked. I answered this yesterday on my instagram oh, questions yeah. but it was uh least favorite is the cranberry sauce and favorite is the stuffing mm -hmm. Ooh. do you like stuffing i think my favorite is pecan pie and i'm probably triggering people by not saying pecan uh but just the same pecan pie is i think my favorite uh least favorite would be the, the like uh casseroles with green beans in them that are usually very creamy because you know Cream don't it's do cream, well. Cream and mushroom soup. Yep. Ooh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the base. All right. You um. Let's see. You have the gift of career resurrection, but only one shot to use it. Which pro cyclist are you bringing out of retirement? Marcel Kittle. Come on. Ooh. Yeah. Because so we never got to see to it do. happen. Yeah. 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 I could see that. 
Alex? I'll let you go first. I'm still thinking. Mm, well, yeah, it's easy for me. Tom Bonin. Uh, man crush all the way through. I mean, we got amazing. to see a lot of racing from him, right? So we got yeah. to see a lot. And I yeah. feel like his career met its proper end. That said, mm-hmm. I still just want to see that guy race more. He was so fun to watch race, made gutsy moves, really I have smart. To admit, he, he did come to mind first, but I was satisfied with his, his entire trajectory, whereas yep. Kittle's definitely got cut short. Yeah, for sure. How about you, Alex? I want to go with Howie, Howard Gratz. I know oh, he yeah. made the decision himself, but man, that guy's talented. And it'd be interesting to see. We're already seeing it now with Chris winning world champs and world cups, but I think given the right motivation, he had a lot of potential and I'm not saying what he's doing isn't right, but Mm -hmm. I think just at the base of it, if he gave it a full shot, he could be up there and it'd be cool to see cross chain or drop down to the little ring. Neither one by. I was about to say (laughs) no front or I'm I'm going full one by next year. Ooh, I like that. Road bikes and everything. I like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I, I cross chain because cross chaining these days, honestly, with chains and their efficiency, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure Friction Facts has something novel to share with me, but I don't think it's as big of a deal as we make it out to be. <clears throat> um, Three watts, bro. Yeah. <laughs> if you could push a button, there's the last one. If you could push a button and make everyone in the world 3% happier, but would also place a worldwide ban on socks for cyclists. Would you push it? <laughs> no. You got, you got to do the math here. You get a 3% uptick in happiness, but a 10% downtick because everyone has to look at cyclists without socks. Yeah. So this is a 3% net happiness, like after exactly. the soft thing. <laughs> net change. Yeah, or is this like yeah. 3% before you press the button? What a fantastic question, Rachel. This is the sort of rapid fire content we need. And that's not all we got. We got more from her. So thinkers. We should do it. Yeah. And and clearly, um, I would not push that button. Um, I apologize to the rest of the world, but uh socks are a necessity for me. Okay. So everybody, thanks for joining us. If you're in the United States, uh happy week of Thanksgiving. Hopefully you get to spend it with those that you are grateful for. Uh, we'd also like to remind you to go check out adapted training. Cause this is typically the time of year when a lot of athletes are starting up their training for whatever they're going through. So, uh, do it trainerroad.com. Check it out. Everyone's getting faster with it. It's super exciting. And we'll talk to you in the following week. Thanks everybody. Take care. Bye everybody. Happy holidays. Bye.